I was proud to be part of a board that hired our first female superintendent, and I'm uh, just as proud to be part of a board that uh, works with our current superintendent, Dr. Reed. So thank you to everyone uh, in our school system, particularly all our women who continue to contribute to making this place a wonderful, accepting, and welcoming place for uh, everyone. So happy Women's History Month. Thank you, Mr. McElveen. Ms. St. John Cunning. Thank you. I'd all, I'm going to speak quickly because I want to spotlight some lesser known um, but, but extremely influential women. Felisa Ricón de Gatera was elected mayor of San Juan, Puerto Rico in 1946, becoming the first woman to be elected as the mayor of a capital city in the Americas. She pushed for child programs that became the inspiration for the United States Head Start program. Sylvia Mendez was eight years old when her siblings and cousins went to register for school in California and were told, we'll take these three, but we won't take those three because they are too dark, meaning Sylvia and her siblings would need to go to the substandard school for Mexican Americans. This resulted in the successful 1947 California desegregation landmark case, Mendez versus Westminster, which paved the road for Brown versus Board of Education. Finally, I'd like to salute my 94-year-old St. John cousin, Dolores Huerta, who has been recognized as one of the most influential labor, social justice, and women's rights activists of the 20th century. Dolores also began her career as a teacher to children of migrant farm workers, many who did not have shoes. When she asked the principal to, for money to buy shoes for her students, she was told, those kids don't need shoes. That's when she realized she could do more to help her students by organizing farm workers, which eventually led her to co-found the United Farm Workers Union with Cesar Chavez. Dolores was the driving force behind the successful table grape boycotts in the late 1960s. Since the 1990s, she has worked to elect more Latinos and women to political office and has championed women's issues. She continues her activism as the president of the Dolores Huerta Foundation and an active board member of the Feminist Majority Foundation. When President Obama awarded Dolores the Presidential Medal of Freedom, he gave her credit as the originator of his campaign slogan, Yes We Can, or more famously known as Si Se Puede. And I hope that all our students in FCPS have that same fighting spirit of Yes We Can and Si Se Puede. Thank you, Ms. St. John Cunning. Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Thank you, and I will also try to be brief, but I wanted to recognize a personal woman groundbreaker in my life, and that is my mother. So many may not know, my parents were both immigrants, but my mother, um, my dad came here on a scholarship and got his PhD from Stanford and University of Oregon, but my mother received her PhD in mathematics with an emphasis on computer science in India in the 1960s, when very few women were receiving such PhDs anywhere. And the importance of this story is about women supporting other women. The reason she was able to receive her PhD is because the then Prime Minister of India, Indira Gandhi, also a woman, um, started a STEM scholarship program for girls to study STEM. And my mom was one of the recipients. And so she, atten she attended Indian Institute of Technology in the 1960s, and as she jokingly said, it was seven women and 7,000 men. She received her PhD in 1966, then came here to a slew of discrimination. She, would walk she could not get a job at a college teaching, even with her PhD. She would walk in in her sari, and people would say, do you speak English? And she said, well, of course, how else am I going to get a PhD? She taught me, she overcame barriers in her own country, cultural barriers, and she found ways to get an education very few women in the world were getting, and then she came here and overcame the same barriers of gender discrimination to be one of the early women working at Intel in the Silicon Valley. She taught me you never let barriers and preconceived notions get in your way of achieving who you can be, and along the way, you should support other women in doing that. So I'll say I'm proud to be in leadership when we hired our second female superintendent, Dr. Reed, and I'm proud of the work you've done. And I owe it to my mom to show me what women can do despite the barriers that society puts in their way. Thank you, Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Ms. Dixit. So I'll keep it brief. Uh, this is really important to all the women and men, obviously, this uh, 
uh, proclamation. I, I did want to say that uh, women empowerment is, is mm -hmm. uh, empowerment the entire race. When we uplift women, uh, we are uplifting the entire society. This is a big uh, cause, and um, I do a lot of things in my personal life and uh, other work, which is towards women empowerment. And um, I just want to say the two little girls in the audience, uh, and they're here today, and I would say you, we are paving the path for you. We're going to do whatever we can in our power so make sure your generation succeeds and you get that equal pay and better opportunities and whatever else you do want to do in your life. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dixit. I will call for the vote. All those in favor? Ms. Sizemore Heiser, Mr. McDaniel, Mr. McElveen, Ms. Lady, Ms. St. John Cunning, Ms. Marin, Dr. Anderson, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Dixit, Mr. Moon, and myself. That is unanimous for all board members present. Uh, agenda item 2.06, Disability Acceptance National Disabilities Awareness Month Proclamation. I call on Mr. McDaniel for a proclamation. Whereas the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 was founded on four principles, inclusion, full participation, economic self-sufficiency, and equality of opportunity for all people with disabilities, and FCPS is committed to the principles of equity, excellence, and opportunity for all students. And whereas inclusion is an attitude, an approach, and a mindset that welcomes and facilitates participation of students with disabilities in every aspect of student life, which requires mutual responsibility for adaptation and removal of barriers so that students with disabilities have the same opportunity to participate in student life as any other student. And whereas Fairfax County Public Schools celebrates efforts to recognize disability awareness and acceptance to increase public awareness and respect for persons with disabilities, inform the public concerning their many contributions to society, ensure accessibility for persons with disabilities, encourage health promotion to increase community awareness of the needs of persons with disabilities, and emphasize the abilities and rights of disabled persons. And whereas over 28,000 and approximately 16% of FCPS students receive special education services and research has shown that students with disabilities encounter more difficulty being accepted by their peers, making friends, and becoming involved in school and community-based activities and clubs than non-disabled students. And whereas the Fairfax County Public Schools provides innovative and individualized programs to advance the achievement and knowledge of students and young adults living with disabilities in the areas of vocational, social, and life skills. And whereas disability is a natural part of human diversity and people with disabilities have the same human and civil rights as everyone else, including the right to be included in all aspects of society, therefore we must ensure they are included in the FCPS community by increasing knowledge and understanding of disabilities, promoting positive attitudes by creating a culture of respect and inclusion, and ensuring the school curriculum and norms, events, and processes are accessible and inclusive of disability history and disability norms. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board does hereby proclaim March 2, 2024 as Disability Acceptance Month in recognition of the many contributions and strengths of people with disabilities and to promote an inclusive school community. And now, therefore, be it further resolved that the Fairfax County School Board renews its commitment to inclusion for all individuals with disabilities in our schools and communities. Thank you, Mr. McDaniel. Miss Lady, or is there a second? Yes. Miss Lady, uh, Mr. McDaniel, would you like to speak to your proclamation? I think the resolution I read did an excellent job of getting all the points across I was going to make, so I will leave it at that. Thank you. Miss Lady, would you like to speak to your second? Yes. Um, I just want to once again uplift uh, all of our students with disabilities with learning differences. Throughout my tenure in education, um, some of these kids taught me the most important things I needed to know, and they've gone on to do amazing, successful things. Um, I'm extremely proud of some of the resources we have here in Fairfax County, and if some of you are not aware, we do have a special education PTA, otherwise known as SEPTA, um, for support, advocacy, and learning. And they hosted a, a conversation on twice exceptional students with, our, with Dr. Reed last night. Um, speaking of uh, twice exceptional, we have three specialists in Fairfax County. Um, we have Kristen Hayner, who is the nation's first neurodiversity specialist in a K-12 public school setting. Um, we also have Nanye Aldeyemija, who is Virginia's first public school twice exceptional educational specialist, and Rachel Rubio is our dyslexia specialist. I'm extremely proud of this commitment 
um, to the work and also the training that these folks are leading in our system so that all of our folks can be better aware, learning skills, and better able to address um, the learning differences of our students. Our Citizens Advisory Committee for Spe Students with Disabilities Committee that delves in FCPS to ensure best practices for our system. Their meetings are open if folks want to attend. We also have many resources in our Family Resource Center. Uh, we have a special education ombudsman in the FCPS ombuds office. And also we have ch a child find team in FCPS who identify children under five with potential <coughs> special education needs, as well as educating the community about child development and the importance of early intervention. So I'm just really proud of what we've done here in Fairfax County, and I just uh, really honor these students. I also want to thank all of our teachers, faculty, administrators who work with our students with special needs and disabilities as they do an amazing job every day. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lady. Ms. Sizemore-Heiser. Thank you, and I couldn't let this one go by without a few words. And so um, in the combination of Women's History Month and um, Disability Awareness Month, I wanted to lift up talking about an amazing disability rights advocate and woman named Judy Human, who recently passed away. She was known as the mother of the disability rights movement in the United States. She was a lifelong civil rights advocate who believed in full inclusion. She, in fact, led both the work to develop the 504 Act which is considered a civil rights act for the accessibility for people with disabilities into society, including leading a multi-day sit-in to make sure this act was signed. She also did seminal work on creating the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which is a civil rights act for the, for the education of students with disabilities that really stopped the segregation of students with disabilities outside of their school. Um, I will say one thing I'm really proud of with some of the language in our resolution that will really talk about not requiring only students with disabilities to adapt and change, but really focusing on the social model of disabilities, which claims that people with disabilities are more disabled by the society they live in than the condition of their disability. So if we really want true inclusion, if we really want civil rights, we have to focus on mutual responsibility for adaptation. We have to focus on removing barriers, and that's mindset barriers as well as physical barriers, and we have to stop expecting only people with disabilities to not be themselves in order to fit in. And we have to finally recognize that disability is a natural part of human diversity, and it doesn't mean you don't provide support, so it's like you do for anybody else who has any need. <coughs> but that people with disabilities have the same human and civil rights. And Judy Human showed us how to do that. And I hope Fairfax County can be a leader in continuing that trend. Thank you. Ms. St. John Cunning. I will be brief. I agree with everything my colleagues said, but I just want to add one more component and thank the parents in our system that help all of us understand and navigate um, the, the system and the challenges that maybe some children with disabilities have, um, their efforts are heroic and sometimes we um, praise our teachers which deserve that, the praise that they justifiably should get. But I also want to recognize and praise all the work and commitment that our parents uh, put into their children and a perfect example is our SEPTA um, PTA because those parents have done monumental work to help educate us and the rest of the public and, the, and that's all parents. So I want to thank the parents for helping us. Thank you. I will call for the vote. All those in favor of the proclamation. Ms. Sizemore-Heiser, Mr. McDaniel, Mr. McElveen, Ms. Lady, Ms. St. John Cunning, Ms. Marin, Dr. Anderson, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Dixit, Mr. Moon, and myself. Will the clerk read the vote? <coughs> It's 11 0, so it's unanimous. Thank you. All present. I would like to invite all those in support of the Women's History Month proclamation to please join the board for a photo at the front of the dais. Uh, after the photo, the guests and staff will depart the dais area. Uh,
I would like to invite all those in support of the Disability Acceptance National Disability Awareness Month proclamation to please join the board for a photo at the front of the dais. There we go. Agenda item 3.01, community participation. The next order of business is community participation. We welcome all community members who are here and those who have signed up to speak this evening. Additional information about signing up to provide comments at school board regular business meetings and public hearings can be found on the school board's website. During the sign-up process, community members acknowledge they were informed of the school board's expectations for proper decorum when providing comments. These expectations are also available online and with the printed agenda and meeting materials in the back of the room. We ask audience members to be respectful of one, of the, one another. Shouting and outbursts will not be tolerated. Please hold your applause until the conclusion of a speaker's remarks. Audience members may not join uh, speakers at the podium and should remain at their seats, including when recording video or taking photos. We are grateful to those who have come to speak to us today and thank you for your cooperation. School board members will be listening but not responding. Madam Clerk, please call the first speaker. Olivia Bradley. Hi. My name is Olivia Bradley and I am a second grader in Miss Watson's class at WSES. I have ADHD and I know there are lots of other kids who also have it. Sometimes kids who don't have a disability or as my mom calls it, a superpower, talk about it or make fun of people and it really makes me sad. I think there should be a day school school where everyone learns about disabilities. Some kids have physical ones and some have ones you can't see, like me. It might help kids not to be mean and learn it's not a joke. I think. Once they learn, they will be kinder. It is important to who be kind and accept people who are different from you because everyone has feelings and emotions. I'm learning to regulate my emotions, which is why I am always late on Tuesdays because I go to therapy with Miss Avery. To help kids learn about differences, I think a counselor should come in and talk about all the uh, different kinds, especially the ones you can't see, like ADHD. I've been talking to him, who my assistant principal, Mr. Pawson, who is right over there, and my, my uh, and my school counselor, Miss Layden, about having a school assembly about differences. But I think every sc school should have one. I told my friend Olivia W about it, who goes to Keene Mill, and she thought it was a good idea. 
and said they, they didn't learn about it either. Ask the school board, can you please make a day where all students at every school learn about neurodiversity? I think this will help people be nicer and I will change the world and I will live happily ever after. The end. Patrice Goch. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Reed and members of the school board. My name is Patrice Gotch, and I'm currently an ESOL teacher at Bryant Alternative High School, a job that I love. But I'm actually here to speak to you about another position I held in FCPS for nine years, my position as a lead teacher in the FCPS ACE adult ESOL program. I love that job too. For nine years, I worked an average of 25 hours a week during the days and in the evenings, year round, yet I was classified as a temporary employee, receiving no benefits, nothing but the hourly pay. Financially, I could no longer afford this job, so I had to leave. But here's a story I wanna tell you. About a year ago, I was teaching an adult ESOL class in the evening, and my lesson plan focused on employment vocabulary. Students were learning terms such as part-time, full-time, benefits, health insurance, retirement, and contract. One of my students also worked for FCPS. She was a custodian. During the lesson, she said, Miss, we have good benefits in FCPS. My heart sank. I didn't want to tell her that while she had good benefits, I had none. Frankly, I was worried that my students would view FCPS devaluing of me as ultimately a devaluing of them. Our adult ESOL students are FCPS parents and FCPS employees. They're members of the Fairfax County community. I value them tremendously, and it was a true honor to serve them for nine years. I ask you to consider this question. Why aren't adult ESOL teachers classified as part-time employees with access to the same benefits as other part-time employees? And is this lack of equity something you stand behind? If not, let's work together to change it. Thank you. Lawrence Webb. Uh, good evening, members of the school board, superintendent. Uh, my name is Lawrence Webb, and I am here tonight not because I really want to be here, but it's because of a disappointment that I have seen last week. Um, on next door, I received, uh, there was an email talking about essentially redlining schools, saying that there were a particular group of schools, we will say they're all minority majority schools, most are in a one particular district of saying these are bad schools. Saying that these are bad schools, ultimately it is going to affect not only the students who attend those schools, but the faculty and staff who attend those schools. I think it's time for the board to really look at how the funding for these schools are, making sure that these students which I look at from my world of higher education for the last 20 years. I've been into many of these schools. There are great students in many of these schools. But because when I moved and my partner moved into the county four years ago, even he was looking at great schools, which said the school that we would, our kids would potentially go to was not a very good high school. And I had to say, that's not true. We are going to a Fairfax County High School, Fairfax County Schools, any of these schools are great schools. But when you see these listings and you see people who are going out here saying and outlining schools as good and bad, it does ultimately affect where people are going to live at in the county. And ultimately it will affect property values. It ultimately will, will affect how these schools are gonna be funded. And I implore the school board and the superintendent to please work hard to make sure these schools are funded to the level they need to. Thank you.
Chair Frisch, that was our last public speaker. Thank you. Agenda item 4.01, Student Representative Matters. I call on Ms. Kareem. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Good evening, everyone. Last week, I had the privilege of attending a two-day equity symposium for equity leads from elementary, middle, and high schools. It was a remarkable experience fostering connections and gaining insights into their personal goals at their respective schools. A pivotal aspect of the event was the SEALS talk where student equity ambassador leaders, known as SEALS, shared their perspectives on various equity issues. About 10 students spoke and their diverse viewpoints were truly eye-opening. One example was their exploration of how student treatment varies across different high schools, a discussion that was very insightful. A student from a secondary school highlighted the inequities in her educational environment. Her narrative revealed that her school primarily offered military and trade opportunities, reflecting a narrower focus on vocational paths, while students from other schools discussed a much broader range of academic and enrichment programs. She also noticed the frequent presence of military recruiters at her school, while other students from different schools discussed the complete absence of them. Furthermore, they discussed, they discussed a significant lack of awareness among students regarding various resources and services avail available to them. Students are often uninformed about the availability of free telehealth services like Hazel Health, the presence of therapists in schools, and access to tutor.com. Even when students are aware of these resources, there's a lack of motivation to utilize them due to the lack of understanding of the benefits they can provide. Remarkably, remarkably, it was only last week that the SEAL students from the Mental Health Committee learned about the telehealth services offered by Fairfax County. If our district is partnering with this service, it raises the question of why these resources are not being effectively utilized. Awareness is crucial in this regard. Even for academy classes, the primary way students become aware of them is through informal channels like word of mouth from friends, rather than official communication from the school system. The same applies to online class offerings, such as the availability of AP or IB classes online, or the internships or certifications associated with academy classes. There seems to be a lack of widespread awareness about these opportunities, and improved communication strategies are needed. Fairfax County offers a wealth of resources, but greater efforts need to be made to make students aware of what is available to them. As Gen Z students, we may not be as receptive to, receptive to lengthy emails or presentations as methods for distributing this information. Instead, concise messages delivered through the social media platforms we frequently use would likely resonate better. Even just quick updates from our guidance counselors highlighting available resources could make a significant difference in raising awareness. And yes, the details may exist on the FCPS website, but that needs to be effectively communicated to students through channels we actively engage with. It should not fall upon students to proactively seek out these opportunities on their own. That places an undue burden on students. Rather, the responsibility should lie within the school system. This issue ties in with school websites. Every school has their own sub-website sub under the FCPS domain, and evidently the setup will vary across high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools. However, it is inequitable that some schools have a more user-friendly layout compared to others, whether it pertains to course selection, academy information, or even lunch information. By centralizing and standardizing the format of these websites to align accordingly, it would tremendously benefit students navigating and accessing information on these platforms. Through this standardization process, we can effectively raise awareness about the resources available to students. Consequently, students will be better positioned to utilize the offerings provided to them. A consistent and intuitive web design across all FCPS schools would not only create a more equitable experience, but also facilitate easier exploration and utilization of educational opportunities and support services available within the school district. Thank you. Agenda item 5.01, action item, sole source contract amendment, the College Board. I call on Ms. Dixit for a motion. I move that school board approves the amendment and authorize the division superintendent or the director of the Office of Procurement Services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. Is there a second? second. Ms. St. John Cunning. Ms. Dixit, would you like to speak to your motion? No. Thank you. Ms. St. John Cunning, would you like to speak to your second? No. Thank you. Mr. Moon. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for thank you for accommodating my request to pull this out of consent agenda so that I could ask some question from staff. That I don't know whether this question goes to uh, doc, Dr. Reed or Dr. Prestige. You can or direct them to Dr. Reed. Thank you. Is willing to answer. Uh, you know, first of all, uh, could you comment upon the a uh, a uh, the amount of money we are spending uh, with this sole source contractor? basically a, on an annual basis or over the course of the last annual period. Um, Dr. Presidio, do you want to provide the specific numbers? I know we provided that in an email. Sure. You know, we are dealing with, we are talking about the college board. Yes. Um, so the sole source contract that you're looking at here is uh, with the college board that we use for our AP, advanced placement exams. Um, our PSAT, which is given at the 10th and the 11th grade year, and the in-school SAT testing, which is given during student senior year. Um, so this particular contract amendment is to add for this year the AP uh, tests. And the reason that we need to do this amendment is when we did the initial contract with the College Board for this particular school year, um, there were some issues moving to the online testing uh, format that the College Board is moving to and we needed to do some additional cybersecurity uh, reviews and uh, agreements with the College Board and those weren't able to be completed on time. So this is coming forward as an amendment to our existing contract um, and the dollar value that you see associated uh, in the materials tonight, it's approximately $3.8 million uh, for the AP exams that we'll give this year. You know, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Presidio. The, the point I'm trying to make uh, from that by asking that question is this. As a party to this contract, school system, FCPS, is paying them a lot of money. That's, uh, uh, you know, the this information that you provided earlier uh, indicates that from 2015 to uh, 2024, by the end of May 31st, uh, that we'll have spent close to $40 million, 30.7 which is a substantial amount of money. But at the same time, I must to, you know, point out that there are quite a few subjects for which the college board is unwilling to provide AP test. Because my understanding is that, you know, some of those subjects are not generating profits for the college board. That is why they are staying away from some of those subjects. In that regard, you know, I must point out that we need to have some discussion with the college board, especially when you know the college board is 501c3 organization, not for profit organization, but, but they are in fact making a lot of profits. You know, if I, I give you some of the figures, other than one year during the pandemic, which was back in 2020, that was the first year of the pandemic, you know, they were making profits in excess of $100 million each year. We're supposed to be a not-for-profit organization focusing on providing benefits to our students. But when they are not providing AP test or SAT2 subject test in certain subjects because they don't generate more profits, I think they got their mission wrong. And especially, in especially a, a, over the course of years, they have accumulated more than a billion dollar of assets. I think it's close to $1.6 billion. I think as a, as a party to this contract, where we spend a lot of money, I think we deserve, uh, we must insist upon having this conversation so that their mission should be focused on providing benefits to our students rather than focusing on profits. Dr. Reed or Dr. Prestige, would you be willing to engage them having this discussion? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, Mr. Moon, you raise a number of really good points. I think um, the College Board has been increasingly inflexible in their responsiveness to the needs, really, of the 22nd century learner. And I'm happy to make contact and make our opinions on that known, um, because I think the move to online assessments will even be less costly for them uh, the lack of the preparation needed for all the documents and so forth, so that should make it even easier to provide more 
uh, content availability. So I'm happy to engage in that and provide you with an update um, after that engagement. You know, thank you, Dr. Korea. You know, if they think that we are a small party to their large enterprise, I think we need to work with all the school districts as well on this one. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Korea. Dr. Anderson. Thank you. And Ms. Samoon, you did hit upon something that I wanted to ask, so I'm just going to pivot to my other question. I want to be sure that there is a clear understanding to the public as to why this has to be a sole source contract. So I'd like for someone to speak to that, please. Well, I think it's a sole source contract because they are the sole provider for AP, um, PSAT, SAT, SAT uh, content exams, and PSAT. So they truly are the only source um, if our students are going to participate in those programs. Thank you. And while we'll be speak, while we'll be voting on this amendment today to the $3.8 million that Dr. Presidio shared, we will be expecting another contract because this current one expires the 31st, correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Ms. Lady. Yeah, I just want to make a few additional points. Um, uh, one, which I believe was the case, at least when I was working, I still think it is, that even our students that are on free and reduced meals, um, that unfortunately the only way for us to get reduced costs or fees waived is for us to send them a list of those names, which we refuse to do. We're not going to breach that confidentiality. I don't know why with, an in, in, with, with the money that they're making that they can't just see what we have and honor the number we give them per test. And the other thing I want to point out is that we're free labor for them. That's the bottom line. Um, you can just take school counselors out of, you know, out of service uh, for two to four weeks, um, which is they're in schools to do exactly what our student representative was just speaking about, which is talking with kids about their, their four-year plans and about college planning and career planning. And we take them out of commission, and we are literally free labor to the college board who are incredibly inflexible uh, when and if we have kids who are sick or have a car accident on the way to a test or something like that. So I just want to make that point, too, that the public understands that, yes, this is a sole uh, source, and we have, to, we have to pass this, but they're, they should be aware of, of the financing. Thank you, Ms. Lady. I will call for the vote. All those in favor? Ms. Sizemore-Heiser, Mr. McDaniel, Mr. McElveen, Ms. Lady, Ms. St. John Cunning, Ms. Marin, Dr. Anderson, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Dixit, Mr. Moon, and myself. Will the clerk read the vote? That's 11-0, so it is unanimous for all those present. Thank you. Agenda item 5.02, action item elementary language arts basal instructional resources K6. I call on Dr. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Are you um, expecting the presentation at this time on the, okay. So it's yes. my uh, pleasure to introduce our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, Noel Clemenko, who has led the team in preparing for our response to our addressing our early literacy uh, challenges in the community. So we're very excited to um, have Ms. Clemenko share our basal resource recommendation with the board this evening. So Ms. Klamenko, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Reed, and thanks to the school board and good evening to all of you. Um, tonight is an exciting night. Um, for some of us, we've been on this journey for, for a few years. It was October of 2021 when the school board uh, made a commitment to shifting the literacy practices in FCPS, shifting from balanced literacy to what we were referring to as the science of reading. It's more, um, it's now kind of been called um, EBLI, or, which is evidence-based literacy instruction. So if you wanna be cool, you're gonna say EBLI instead of science of reading. But in general, we made that commitment in 2021, and here we are tonight um, with the opportunity for you all to approve a basal, a basal resource. Um, I wanted to, before I just dive into the basal resource, I just wanted to say that journey that the school board set us on is articulated clearly in our equitable access to literacy plan. If anybody wants a brochure, I did bring them for you. But um, we really did lay out a path to make this change because I don't think we can really underestimate what a significant transition probably the largest instructional transition I have seen in my very long career um, the impact um, that it's had on teachers 
and the impact that it will have on students. So it's an exciting time. And tonight marks really a huge milestone, not only for a milestone for our EL plan, but for also for the Virginia Literacy Plan, uh, Virginia Literacy Act, which I'm um, going to start to just share a bit about here at the beginning. I don't think I have a clicker, do I? Great. So just for your reference, this um, basal adoption is part of a bigger requirement that was set out by um, uh, Virginia. It's called the Virginia Literacy Act, and it has several components to help us align um, our practices to um, EBLI. And the first act came out in 2022, which only really encompassed K-3, and then in 2023, they added on four through eight. So sometimes when we're talking about this tonight, or if you hear about, about this work, it's very piecemeal from VDOE because they are trying to do a lot of things at one time. So it could get a little confusing, but I'll be happy to try and clarify. One part of VVLA, it's multifaceted things that we'll be required to do come fall, is the adoption of an evidence-based core program. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, VDOE worked over the last year plus to um, give us a list of approved materials. They're also doing lists of supplemental and intervention materials that will come out later this month. But for now, they have approved core materials for grades uh, really K through five, but the elementary level. Go ahead and switch the slide. So what does this mean for us? So when um, FCPS adopts a basal resource, we have a regulation that covers the whole thing, Regulation 3004, which usually starts with an RFP. But because Virginia put out a list and required us to choose off of this list, then we were able to kind of skip the RFP process and go right to um, the um, vetted materials. We conducted a 30-day public review, and we also convened an, II, an IRRC, which is the Instructional Resource Review Committee. And um, then they, the committee, recommends to you a resource. We've also looked at cost proposals. I will kind of expand a little bit on the public review and the IRRC um, in this presentation. We also have already done some preliminary work to ensure that the resource being recommended by the committee does meet all our IT and security review because we would want, not want to get to the end and realize that we could not implement. So we have, we have done that pre-work. Next slide. So just to kind of give you a sense of where we've been, for those of you who have been on the board for a while, we had a whole other thing, but we're not going to talk about that other thing tonight because we might as well just start with where we are, right? Where we are is uh, June 2023, the Board of Education of Virginia came out with the list, and we were all waiting, what's the list, what's the list? So once we got the list, it only really involved K-3, um, but we asked all of those vendors to said, send us K-6. We're not going to piecemeal this and think about this. We want to go ahead and start looking at things more broadly. We put things out for a 30-day review. We brought the IRRC together. Um, and then we waited because the, they, we were told they're coming out with another list, which may have more K3 and some 4.5s. So they came out with another list, and we did the whole rigmarole again, another public review and another IRRC. Um, but we got there. We got here, and we're here tonight, and um, so we have cost evaluations, and we're here tonight to seek your approval. Next slide. So just, I'm not going to read all this to you, but basically, as I said, we had to go through two public reviews. Public review is a time for anyone in the community to give us their opinion. To take a look, either in person, we have the materials at Pimmett Hills with Saturday hours and nighttime hours. We also um, put everything online so people can take a look, at least get a real sense of it. And we provide the hours, and then we bring back all those recommendations, and we bring those recommendations to our committee. So when they're looking at it, they're not just seeing what they're seeing, but they're also hearing from the community. Because we had two sets of resources, we did that twice. Next slide. The IRRC, the Instructional Resource Review Committee, is an incredible part, and you all are getting an education tonight for those of you who are new to this. This is the same process we go through with all basils, um, and this is just the first one for this, for this board. But the IRRC started, first started meeting, um, well, before that, it is a board-approved committee. 
right? And it's made up of 60% teachers, 20% school-based administrators, and 20% community members. And all of the board members have an opportunity to put someone forward. And then we work with our region assistant superintendents, and we also um, solicit um, applications from teachers. So it's a very, a very large group of people, um, and all regions are represented. The diversity of Fairfax County is represented, and we really are very intentional to ensure that we have different school sizes, different demographics, that we have ESOL teachers, that we have special education. Um, teachers and that we have um, advanced academics, teachers of advanced academics. So we're very intentional to make sure that we have lots of voices around the table. Next slide. They came together um, in July and August 1st for six full days in the summer and they, um, they first were grounded in EBLI or the science of reading. We want to make sure, and we brought these educators together and we were asking them to select something that was going to move us in our new direction, that they were versed. I and mean, we had teachers who had obviously been through some training, but we also had community members who were new to this. So it was an exciting time to sort of do some, some professional development and help them understand the evaluation criteria. And then we evaluated eight different products over the summer. In January, we were able um, to bring everybody back for two more days after we got the new list. So at that time, four of the products from the summer we had eliminated um, based on summer recommendations. Two of them had been um, uh, removed from the list because they would not meet our cybersecurity and DIT needs. Um, and then so at that January time, the committee was down to four products. Three were products they had looked at, but in this time, as things are moving so fast with literacy, resources are also improving. Um, so we also, we got to look at some products that reevaluate some products that had actually even made some changes since summer. And then we had one new approved um, from that new video list. Next slide, please. Real quickly, I think you could probably imagine um, what they were, what all the committee was looking for. They were looking for the evidence-based design, making sure it had sound pedagogy, right? We want to make sure that the instructional strategy is really aligned with our learning model and what we know about um, uh, best practice. We wanted to make sure that it was usable, right? We wanted to make sure that it felt like teachers would be able to go in and use it and that there would be adequate support for um, teachers in, in designing instruction. We also needed to make sure that the content actually aligned with what we call the reading rope or the simple view of reading and all the things we know about EBLI, that they had both word recognition, which is often the phonics and phonemic awareness, as well as the language comprehension and writing parts. We wanted to make sure that all students would be able to access the materials and that there was built-in differentiation for our teachers and that there were high quality cultural responsive texts and materials. This is just a little snapshot of how, um, how the committee members kind of captured, how they captured their ideas. Basically, they had look fors and we had presentations from vendors, and so they were taking notes. They also had all the print materials there and the online materials, and they would, uh, they would do their own kind of note capturing, and then they would meet in grade level teams to really talk and debrief and complete the summary sheet. Next slide, please. After that, all the, the we had after all the presentations, we brought all the groups together and we tried to find out, are there any, are there any things that we say, no, this will not work in Fairfax for a variety of reasons. So we, we would eliminate those. Then we would look at the products vertically. And then finally, the teams made their final uh, rankings and recommendations. Next slide. So without further ado, there was a lot of build up to the, the product that we chose. It's called Benchmark Advance Adelante, but mostly we call it Benchmark Advance. Um, this product, um, I'm going to talk about why we picked it, or why the committee picked it, I should say. I have the next slide. So what was some of the rationale that the committee used? Um, that there was strong differentiation and cultural responsiveness. This, you know, it's a hallmark of Fairfax County to ensure that the materials that we use with students are culturally responsive and that all students can see themselves in the materials. So that was a, a big piece of what people are looking for. Another thing that stuck out about this is the alignment to letters. Letters stands for Literacy um, Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. It's a training that we've put more than a thousand teachers through. I say that because it is grueling, um, but people love it. Um, it's really the content of EBLI, really helping teachers know what to do, and that it was aligned with the Virginia SOLs. 
part of our change, which isn't really a change of all, at all, is really ensuring that our instruction has a strong knowledge building. We often, when we talk about EBLI, everyone talks about the phonics, the phonics, the phonics, and certainly that is a big part. The word recognition is a big part of what we're doing, but we also want to make sure there's strong knowledge building across, um, across literacy. And the, these materials really have a lot of connected text examples, phonics building, foundational skills, um, the other parts we liked were includes ELD resources aligned with WIDA. So these are built into the core materials. So we have things ready to go for um, um, our ESOL students. And aligned assessments to track progress in real time and built in tier two. So there's a lot of things built in. One thing that we know is that we have, we have a continuum of teachers in our classrooms and a lot of teachers are asking for things that are more ready to use, right? Things that are organized, things that are connected, things that they can just take and use with kids. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't have to be responsive, that they don't have to look at data, and they don't have to know their students. I don't mean any of those things, but once they have that data, things that are ready to go, that they're not spending time creating, they're spending time making those connections with students and to students with the learning. So engaging books uh, for students, and as I said, easy to use for teachers. We're gonna move to the next slide. The, the Benchmark Advance is, has the third party endorsements, um, wasn't really part of our, our um, committee work, but we do wanna make sure that when we go to outside sources, we're not finding things that are deficits that perhaps we missed. Next slide. There are a lot of videos here, and I promise you we're not watching any of them, but I wanted to put them in because sometimes the community wants to just click on a video and watch something quick and not read through all the, all the slides, but just to give a little bit of sense, and, and maybe for some teachers watching, a little excitement about what's to come. Next slide. One of the things that Benchmark has that we're very excited about is they have some additional supplements that we can purchase. And Dr. Reed has made it clear to me that we need to make sure we're not shortchanging the teachers. We're gonna buy something. We need to buy what they need to do an excellent job with all of our learners. And, and what you see up here is a list of things that Benchmark um, provides that we have been looking at to add on to the core materials. I won't go through all of them, but a couple I wanna highlight. Benchmark Express are some English language development program. So it would be used a lot by our, uh, it would be used by our ESOL teacher, but it's completely aligned to the core program. So the kids won't feel like they're going here and then here. It is aligned and supportive for that language um, development. So I think that's gonna be awesome. We currently use Benchmark Hello for our newcomers really to help them uh, with, um, of just adjusting to, be in, to being in our schools. So that's a great program that we're gonna continue. We are able to add some pre-K, even though the adoption is really gonna be K-6. This will be for, uh, we can add, we're going to add alphabet animal friends for pre-K. And you see there's some other things there that um, some in interventions and things that we'll also be able to add. Slide. I want to be clear that no basil is perfect, no product is perfect, and no product is going to do us any good unless we really help prepare teachers to use it well. And so we have a, we have a plan to um, really, first of all, get these materials to teachers as soon as possible. So if, should we have approval tonight from you all, we will be moving to the contracting phase and bringing the contract back here, excuse me, for your approval, but we are getting the wheels of professional development starting, getting this in front of principals, getting early access, getting these materials to schools before teachers leave, and having summer a, a three-day summer literacy institute. Now, we are asking all teachers to attend, but we also know all teachers can't attend in the summer, right? So we are paying, compensating people for attending this summer for the three-day. The, the uh, training, if, if teachers cannot attend, we are kind of breaking that out and we will work that in through, through the school year the best we can and, and we know that we're gonna have supportive. I will tell you, supportive colleagues, I will tell you we are, uh, we are over 50% of the teachers have signed up um, and we believe that we, are, um, we have some encouragement. We've recently raised the um, hourly rate from $15 to $25 an hour and we think that that will help bump up and encourage a few more people. Um, it's pretty hard to even get daycare for $15 an hour, so we're hoping that that extra money will encourage. Um, so we have a lot of things, and I'm not going to read all this to you, but we do have not just a summer PD plan. The one thing you can't do is launch a basil and then forget it. 
We are going to have to have care and feeding of this for quite some time as we support teachers with really, we have not had a basil in over 20 years. Most of our teachers have never used what, what people might call a big box product like this. So it's a big change and we wanna make sure that we start strong and when we continue the support as it's needed. Next slide, I think it's the last one. So what you can look for after tonight's vote and after your questions and after tonight's vote, um, we'll have um, an opportunity to bring the, the final contract back to you later, um, later this spring to make sure everything's set. But um, one of the questions that's come up a lot that I'll just address is where is this in the budget, right? I, how come we didn't see this in the budget? Well, we were supposed to purchase this two years ago. We were supposed to purchase a basil two years ago and that's when the state passed the Literacy Act and let us know that we had to pick off their list. So we paused, saved the money. Dr. Reed was very proactive last year and said, you're not going to have enough money. And some money was set aside last year. So we feel very confident that we do not have to ask the school board for any new funds um, to, oh, thank you, <laughs> any new funds to make this purchase. And we're very excited. And that would include not only the purchase, but the, the professional development. And that is the whole presentation. Thank you. All right, before we go to board member questions, just so everybody knows what we're going to do here, it's a little unusual. We're gonna have board member questions for the presentation, um, and, uh, at, and then we're going to vote on uh, the item that was on the consent agenda uh, as a standalone action item. Uh, so, um, you don't need to speak now if you don't have questions. If you wanna to speak to the actual motion, you don't need to speak now. If you do have questions, now's the time to speak, and I'll start with Dr. Anderson. Thank you, thank you for this presentation. Um, I think there's a lot of excitement around that in our community who's been, that have been waiting for this information, but I'm gonna drill down in the sense of time with my questions. What can parents expect? Because you, as you mentioned, we've never had a basil in Fairfax County. Mm -hmm. Will there be a text that comes home? Will it just be all digital as I know some resources are currently? Can you speak to that a little bit, please? Yes, I can, and, and just so you know, if you all ask me anything too hard, I do have my language arts coordinator online so I can phone a friend, but I think I got this one. Um, so, first of all, this is not a fully digital project. There are There is digital access, but, um, and Ms. Marin was overlooking at things, there are books and there are papers and, um, and we will expect, I hate to use the term workbook because that sounds so last decade or last century, but Some but traditional yes. practices are good. Good, well <laughs> then some of that is definitely coming. And so some of those materials will come home and there's also some of the decodables that they'll use in school. There are like black and white versions they can take home so they can practice at home. So there are many things to go back and forth and, and I think it's really important communication. And this has come up and we're partnering with the Office of Communications. Like how should we start messaging this out to parents? so they'll know what to expect and, and really generate the excitement um, with parents as well. So um, that is on our mind to make sure that parents have information about what to expect and that teachers are really clear about what can be going home and what should be going home. So are we talking about the more traditional approach where every child who's in K, well, pre-K six, I think you, and you well, you have some components for pre-K, but every child from K six will have their own text. So it's it's a series of things, right? There's like um, there's there's like um, I guess they're workbooks. I, there's writing books and there's um, small small decodable books. There's mm -hmm. a lot of different materials, but yes, they will be holding things in their hands. Um, we're really buying the core materials for K through six, and that includes our six in the middle um, uh, students. And so there are it is a more traditional approach, I would say. I taught a long time ago when everybody had their books and their decodables, so I'm kind of excited for that, Only be, also because it brings us a little bit out of the constant use of the computers, which at one point we needed, but right now I think there's a heavy dependence that I part particularly don't care for. It's just one too many slide decks. Uh, my next question that you kind of started to speak to is what is this going to look like for our middle school kids who are sixth graders, which I am the only school board member who has any. 
and we know that we need intentionality and some different planning for them, right? Because they, ha they run on different schedules sometimes and they have different, um, their teachers are typically teach only language arts. So that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a bonus, right? We don't have to teach as many teachers, or we don't have to train as many teachers, but we really need to help them look at each individual schedule and look how they meet with students and look at times like advisory and really, it has to kind of be customized. Um, we have a meeting, I think it might even be tomorrow, with the, the principals of those schools, with our team, to really dig into what their master schedule mm -hmm. looks like and how they can best use these materials. We know it's not, it's not a plug and play for them. Oh, that's very interesting mm -hmm. to hear because I know typically these programs, there are certain times that are to, to be devoted to each component of the reading day, but right. I, I'm not sure how it plugs into the 80 minutes that our sixth graders at the middle schools have. So I would love to have an yeah, opportunity of what that keep... plan looks like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. And I don't want to uh, run out of time before I do this. I do want to give a shout out to Ms. Cheryl Binkley because she was my representative, former teacher, now community member, yeah. and you all are very familiar with her. She was part of that first group that we won't <laughs> talk about. <laughs> and now she also yeah, um, she led was, her uh, time and both. expertise to this next yeah. group. So thank you so much for all of your work um, along, that, along those lines. Here's the hard, hardest question of the night. Uh-oh. I think everybody's excited about this, and I'm particularly interested in the ELD pieces that you have for our students, the alignment with WIDA, that is great. What are we going to do for our students who are of those same levels but are 7 through 12? Grades 7 through 12. Jump it. So there's a lot of different ways to approach. Are you talking about for a basal resource? Or are you talking about in general? Any and all of it, because I think there's a mm -hmm. major cry for our students who are at those grade levels, right. but parents are not hearing that there's any plan for them, and yet they still present the same issues. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and it's something that we're constantly looking at. I, I will just say that you know the teachers in middle school really went to school to be English teachers not reading teachers and you know that doesn't sound maybe like a big difference but they really look at their jobs a little bit differently they they did not have the opportunity to learn how to teach students to read. So it's a little bit of a slower, um, a slower change to have them really understand the evidence-based practices that we're talking about. We've started that work a little bit through our staff development days. We have, and I know it's not everyone's favorite, so it's not really, we're not here to debate it tonight, but we have purchased Lexia from middle school. And I know that's not everyone's favorite because it's an online tool. But we have to understand, we have to understand that we have kids in all different places in middle school. And we have teachers who aren't necessarily prepared to meet all those different places at this moment in time. So Lexia does provide us, does provide us that individualization. And Lexia has, I see lots of faces, sorry. Um, I'm, um, Lexia also is not only online. It is a hybrid program, so students should be getting some online work and some support for teachers. It's something we, that is new to middle school really this year, so it's still a work in progress, but we're trying to at least do something that we could do relatively quickly to try and capture some of the students who really need some of those foundational skills that, that, um, that we could provide. Now you mentioned quite a bit about the middle school teachers. What about mm -hmm. the high school teachers? Because we still have students who don't have those foundational skills at our high schools. Uh, whether they be uh, ELL students, mm -hmm. whether they be special education students, or just students who just haven't caught on yet. What's the plan there? So a lot of times when we get to high school and we're still having some of the foundational, um, uh, the foundational struggles, it does take something more intense, mm -hmm. right? It, it really can't be done through your traditional English class and the English teacher doesn't really have the skills to do that. So then you start to look at intervention classes, which isn't something we really um, want for students, right? We want them to arrive at middle school and high school not needing those interventions but we do have students who need them. So really taking a look at what we are offering at the, um, at the middle and high school and trying to ensure that those are meeting the variety of needs. So we are looking at our different intervention programs. We're trying to see how those classes need to be changed. It is a partnership. A lot of the students, as you said, are special education. So it's a partnership with Gen Ed and Special Ed um, to see what's the right program. We've done a lot of the OG training, which is the Orton-Gillingham training, mm -hmm. um, at the secondary level. And we're doing as much as we can to keep, that, to keep that going so that we can build more capacity in middle and high school to meet those needs. 
I would be very much interested in terms of what you uncover and what you come up with to help support our students, particularly those that are in the high school, at the high schools, in order to provide them with those basic skills that they don't have yet, but yet they're, they have all the other expectations. Um, this is a core, so there's the core um, text, there's supplemental intervention as well. So this is um, this is the core materials, and as part of the core materials, we talk about inter we talk about tier one being for everybody, tier mm -hmm. two being sort of um, happening in the classroom when students need a little bit more, and tier three is usually outside of the classroom. Um, the core materials actually already embed tier two, um, and then from Benchmark, we've looked at all their intervention materials, and we are planning as part of those supplements to purchase the language comprehension part, we already have some strong interventions for the word recognition part of um, the reading rope, but we are planning on purchasing some intervention materials from Benchmark as well. Thank you for that. What well, I don't Dr. think Anderson, I heard... your time is up. I'm... Oh, can I just finish this one question and yeah. maybe go back? What I didn't hear in yes. that part is the challenge materials. What are the extension materials for our students who are already working at high levels? Yeah, so a couple things. One is there are built-in um, materials. That's why it was very important for us to have teachers that work in, cent in our advanced academic centers and some of our advanced academic resource teachers on the committee. So some things are built in, but we will also be supplementing with some of our um, current materials that we use with um, advanced academics. But again, it's about really helping figure out how that fits together and not asking teachers to figure all that out. Thank you. I could go back. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anderson. Ms. Anderson. Okay, so you mentioned Lexia. So I had I had to speak up, but I have two questions for you. Sure. Actually, I have two. I have, you, you know I'm not a fan. Um, we've talked a lot about the fact that I believe that it's not being consistently implemented, at, particularly at the middle school level. I say that anecdotally, um, that it's it's not. And this, particularly for our students that have gone through advanced placement, classes, it's just not at the level that's maybe necessary. And so that is something that I would like us to continue to sure. keep looking at to make sure that it's being utilized. It's also being utilized maybe inappropriately at the elementary school level too in certain schools. And so I would love to just see us maybe look at how much time our kids are spending on Lexia. Use those, use those IT resources that we have to kind of get user data so that we can get some more information about that. Um, the question that I did have about the basal resources. Mm -hmm. And I know, and from what I understand, and um, Ms. Eismoorheiser can probably speak to this much better than I can. However, I do understand that it's not necessarily approved, this particular product is not necessarily approved for special education students, is that correct? I don't have any information. We are purchasing this for special education okay. students. Okay, so it is, it yes. is tiered for special education students as well. That is my understanding. Okay, because that I was under the impression. I'm not sure. I mean, I would be interested to know. You know, I'm certainly happy to take that question offline if you I have would some other to, information. I would love to just happy to do, that. do a little bit more because I think that that may be a misconception in the community. Okay. So I would love to make sure that we actually go back and, and make sure that for our special education families that they're prepared for for what's coming. So I think, uh, thank you, Ms. Anderson. I think what's really important about uh, rolling out a new uh, literacy curriculum is that every student. Each and every student uh, needs core instruction at grade level, period. And then we move to um, tutorial or enrichment uh, within a 90-minute literacy block. So it's really key, as Ms. Clemenko said, that every student is going to receive um, core instruction at grade level. So. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Uh, Ms. Sizemore-Heiser. So a couple things. I really appreciate. I'm very excited being having been on the board that voted to do this in 21, and then watching sort of impatiently through all the pauses while we waited for the state to come out with their materials. I'm really excited to see that we've you know, purchased these materials and ready to roll this out. So thank you for all your work and patience um, on this piece of it. Um, I did want to go back to your your statement about um, middle school and high school, and and. I think to pick up on Dr. Anderson's point about there's a lot of students who are now in middle and high school who didn't get this in elementary school, right? So they're, they're maybe without this foundation or with a different foundation. And I, and I heard you saying, you know, we can address some of this in sort of the um, intervention classes, and you probably know where I'm going with this, mm -hmm. but we really can't take an elective away from an entire generation of students to put them in intervention classes. And I, I hear that 
you know, English teachers at the secondary are, are trained to teach English, but I think we maybe need to rethink some of that if we have a generation that maybe didn't get this when they you know, could have because we were focused on something else at the time, and a lot of the country was. So how are we gonna maybe provide PD so some of it is embedded in those English classes? How are we gonna better utilize the intervention block as opposed to an elective? That's my question for you on these pieces. So one of the things I didn't mention, and I'll start with middle school. We're spending a lot more time talking about middle school than high school, and I, I, I hear the message. I, I get it. Um, but we have new Virginia standards coming out this fall as well, and I didn't really mention that. But they, uh, Virginia did not want us to be rolling out the Virginia Literacy Act with really standards that didn't align to the work they were asking us to do. Unfortunately, that means we don't get a bench, we don't get a crosswalk year, we have to hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. And the new standards really, I think, are more intentional around the foundational skills, especially at middle school. Um, I think that will, that will help us move the teachers in that direction, um, for sure. And I haven't looked at the high school standards as much, so it will be interesting um, to look at it with that lens. When the idea of intervention um, isn't new, right? We have intervention classes at middle school now for reading. We have all sorts of different programs. There's different varieties, different flavors at both middle and high school. And what I think is important to do is really look at what we do have and make sure what we have is aligned with what, what we're doing now. And we need to do, we need to do a refresh. But unfortunately, and I, and I know nobody wants to hear it, but it does take a little bit of time to, to make those rollovers and to train the teachers. So we are looking at it and we are trying to move as fast as we can. Um, I think it's probably about trying to figure out what is, you know, the house on fire, what do you grab first? Like trying to figure out where to start. I know we have some interventions that um, special ed has been working through new approvals, so I haven't seen what those are yet um, through that RFP process. So I think it's about looking at the interventions and where we can deliver them best. So I'm glad you said that. That led to my next question, and I think it's going to pick up what Ms. Anderson said. I'm kind of picking up the Andersons over there. Um, but the question I have is I, I think the question is really as you know, specialists looking at their materials, how are they in line with the materials, the basal resources that we've just approved from the state, especially for those self-contained students who are on the ASOL curriculum, right? Like, how are these materials being either adapted or aligned with what special ed is doing? So it's not special ed is picking these materials and these are the K-6, especially for those self-contained ASOL students, but really all the self-contained students. So we are buying these materials for everybody. Right, and, and our um, special ed colleagues have been in the boxes with us and trying to, you know, they really need to look at those and, and see how they're going to be adapted, you know, to work. The interventions I was just kind of mentioning are really tier three and sometimes sit outside the tier one and tier two and, and this, this resource. Um, but the intention is, because when we, we picked these, we were intentional to have special ed um, colleagues as part of that process. And we've had them, um, we have the materials, they're in the boxes, and we're trying to figure out what's the best way to do it. I mean, it's the best answer I can give right now because we literally are just weeks in, but the intention is for everyone to be able to use the materials and for us to adapt the materials as needed, but that, that everyone is aligned in sort of the units and what we're doing. Thank you, and I guess the question I would ask is for those tier three materials mm -hmm. that are maybe are being RFP'd right now mm -hmm. to make sure those are not just aligned with but consistent with these materials. I don't know where that crossover yes. is from, this, from the teachers of the Cat B classes in picking these materials and making sure that we're not kind of having two tracks in that alignment right. too and the consistency of the um, type of education even though they may be you know, modified, right? There's modifying these materials and then there's picking tier three materials Right, they may not be modifying these materials, but separate materials, but how are we making sure those are still in alignment with the science of reading? Understood, yeah, the alignment to science of reading and, and um, is critically important. Yes, I would just say that maybe having some crossover the other direction too, right, mm -hmm. on the special ed groups, and maybe you're already doing that, might be helpful too to make oh, sure. Oh, into the, yes, we do. We okay. have people who sit in the RFP with the, I mean, is that what you mean? Yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Perfect. yes. And then, um, I agree with Ms. Anderson on, on Lexi. I think it is an implementation. I will say I think it's maybe as it's gone from being used, I think in more of the special ed setting to more generally, the, some of the implementation has gotten inconsistent. So that might be something to look at. Yeah, I mean, I will say and, and happy to, to, share, um, to share with the board. I mean, we have some excellent data that Lexia is really helping a lot of students. I do not, I do not uh, 
disagree that implementation is always a challenge here in Fairfax and middle school especially is a big is a is a challenge around this so we continue to work on it and always open to hearing specific feedback thank you Ms. Sizemore Heiser Mr. Moon thank you Mr. Chairman uh, thank you for the presentation I have a couple of budget related questions since we are in the middle of budget season that I'm glad <coughs> I'm glad to hear that Superintendent foresaw this coming and set aside an additional, added additional money the last year. And initial, initial funding came from a couple of years ago mm -hmm. after the board, prior board, decided to go this way. However, my question has to do with this. A, at the time the prior board decided to do this, there was an option on our part. There was a no Virginia law requiring us to do this that the Virginia Literacy Act came only in 2022 and 2023. That's a subsequent prior board taking on action. Correct. So the point that I'm trying to make is when the state legislature passed this new law and expanded it in 2023, did they really understand about a financial implications of requiring something like this? I mean, I, I take the, my understanding is that uh, they gave us one-time funding, grant money, of $5.6 million, but the cost of doing this is where it exceeds 5.6. Am I wrong? No, that's correct. By how many folds? Is that something that you can talk about? How many boards? Folds. How many times? Oh, how many folds? I think it's in boards. Um, it's quite a bit more. I, don't, yeah, I, so I haven't the, seen the current oh, final contract. And we are we don't have a final contract yet. We do early negotiations just to make sure, sure we would be able to afford it. But we are um, we're anticipating it will be some for the product itself around twenty five million. So there's a huge gap between five what the, the five yeah, so what the state is funding. We are only getting about twenty percent. As part what of their, as, may cost us. Right. as part of their all in Virginia money, they said that we could designate a certain amount for literacy, mm -hmm. and for us, for Virginia, that was was five. We don't have to spend it on the basil, but on on anything, um, you know, related to this act. I think that's another thing. We need but to it point. doesn't even begin. <clears throat> I mean, we have a lot of needs. There's a lot more. There's a lot of things happening around literacy. All the teacher training beyond just um, just beyond the basil resource. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question about that too. Uh, you said three days of professional development. Mm -hmm. uh, but sounds like uh, if it's $25 per hour, if you put eight hours, that's $200. Three days is $600. I don't know how many teachers we're talking about, 5,000? If everyone were to come, because we do include special education and ESOL teachers, and that, it's, it's close to 6,000 teachers. Close to 6,000, okay, all right. Is that already counted for in, in money set aside yes. or? Yes, it is. Thank you, thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, again, thank you for seeing us doing that. But at the same time, I think this is uh, another thing that we need to point out to a, our delegation, if not the entire General Assembly in Richmond, that you know, whatever, whenever they require something for us to do, that has consequences that affects us, affects our bottom line. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Mr. McElveen. Uh, thank you, and um, thank you, uh, Ms. Klemenko, and to all of staff uh, for what has clearly been uh, an extremely large uh, amount of work that has gone into this, um, not to mention all the engagement with the community. It's always great to see that um, you've, you've done all that outreach in advance. Um, I will just uh, speak from anecdotal experience. Uh, as many folks know, uh, my father was in the FCPS classroom for many years as an eighth grade English teacher. Um, and what he saw over, over his career um, post uh, 2000 or so was a yearly decline in the abilities of our students, whether it comes to being able to write cogently, to spell, the fact that they were getting to middle school without just those basic skills points uh, to how, and, and, and by the way, that's in honors and AAP classes, um, points to the incredible importance of, of doing this and getting it done right as, as soon as possible. So this work can have come at a, a more important time. Um, I will just briefly um, touch also from my personal experience that um, phonics uh, for my first grader is working very well. 
Um, Lexia is working uh, extremely well. Um, she's gone on to the next level, first in her class to do it. And by the way, um, she's actually cat categorized as an ELL uh, because we speak Chinese at home and I can't get her out of the, um, <laughs> the, uh, that, that system, unfortunately. So that's another problem we have. But um, the, the only question I would have for you is what kind of uh, reaction are you getting um, from our classroom teachers to, to this so far? So I think it, it varies, right? We have people who are very excited because you know we started this work when the board made the commitment and you know we were piecing things together and teachers have been heroically piecing things together to try and, and start to provide these foundational skills. Um, not everybody was excited to make this change. As you can imagine, there were teachers who um, had, for years had been really very successful with the balanced literacy approach and were very, um, uh, it was a very hard change in the beginning. And those of you who were on the board definitely heard from teachers and, and we all worked through that. I think this is coming after three years of work where we've been able to send thousands of teachers to training, whether it's letters or Orton-Gillingham training. Um, we've done a lot of our own um, work with our literacy leaders. So I think we're ready for this, right? We're ready, we've got enough, um, we've built enough momentum, but I think it is gonna be a really, something very different um, because we're pretty clear, we're expecting every teacher to use this. Now, of course, they're gonna be responsive to their students in front of them and they'll make adaptations, but we are expecting every teacher to be using that and that's perhaps it's gonna feel different for people as well. So this is a, this is a, a maybe a paradigm shift in Fairfax a little bit around literacy that um, we're expecting a lot more um, consistency and to use these materials and we are, um, I think a lot of people are excited to have these and to really not be creating everything or I shouldn't say creating because we've always provided materials. I want to be clear about that. But teachers had to make a lot more, they had to architect it together from the pieces. And now hopefully some of that will be done for them and they can spend more time assessing the students and matching and, and instructing. So I guess what I'm saying is some teachers are excited, some teachers are, are leery and hesitant. Um, I've already told our, our teachers that come to the superintendent teachers, I'm a little scared to come next fall as we're rolling this out because implementations are hard, right? This is gonna be a change and it's a lot to learn and these systems, there's a lot of pieces. There's a lot of things and they're doing it with kids in front of them. So we need to give teachers a lot of space and grace and support and I know they can be successful, but we all have to know it's going to take a little time. I hope that's helpful. That is helpful. And I, I, uh, I know you will be there every step of the way with them. And I think as a board, um, we need to be prepared uh, for um, the, the... You might hear some stuff. You might that, hear some that, stuff that, come fall that, that people are like, what did these people do, right? And, and, and rightfully so, people need to be able to, to vent and stuff, but we will support them. I just will say that. We will support right. them. Well, uh, if anyone knows change is hard, it's, it's this board. Um, so I'll just end by saying that um, I do want to thank prior board for their foresight, uh, Dr. Reed for their foresight, and pushing ahead even, as Dr. Moon mentioned, before the, um, the state took action. So thank you all. Thank you, Mr. McElveen. Ms. Marin. I'm going to save the bulk of my enthusiastic um, support for the motion a little bit later, but I, because I do think this is a night to celebrate. Half about half of the students in our schools are going to have this transformative work. And I think it's a night to celebrate it. And there will be questions and time for that. But one question I have is, Ms. Clemenko, you mentioned that it's been a few decades since we've had a basil. What is the expected lifespan of this investment and when should we plan to do so? I, I get the idea that 20 years is too long. What would be a goal for us so we could not be late to update this in the future? So what I will say is that the contract is seven years, and that's the typical cycle of a basal. Um, we are on a cycle, like once we're done with language arts, in a minute we're gonna have to start math and social studies, right? We go con constantly on a cycle of refreshing our basal resources. So the contract is seven years. Um, I do think that hopefully we will continue to see um, the, the um, product will continue to evolve. I mean, the, what we saw from, Jul from July to January for this product, they really, the thing they did that was the most helpful, I think, is they removed a lot of things. What we've seen in the last couple of, um, what we've seen in a lot of the products is 
they were so um, infused with balanced literacy and then the science of reading came, they just piled on. So teachers are not only getting the new stuff, but the, all the old stuff was still there. And what a confusing and mess for teachers, right? So things are still sort of evolving and settling and, and the um, vendors are usually, you know, are providing us updated materials. So I think it will continue to evolve with us over the seven years, but short answer is seven years. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Mayor. And I'm going to take a turn, just a little more context here, and I appreciate everybody's comments about uh, the past board. Um, and I also appreciate that the presentation focused on the now, um, because we've been over some of the things that we've done over the years. But just to put a finer point on it, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Instructional Services began working with community members to talk about this a few years ago, and then the board took action to move us in this direction. Um, Y'all began training people, looking at materials, developing materials. There was probably going to be a move towards developing our own materials for this transition, right? And then the state took action, and then we had to wait for their materials, or else we would have perhaps been caught down the road with materials that they didn't approve of. And so now we're finally here, which is a big deal, um, particularly since we're already partway into this path of educating our students using this method, um, and we are beginning to see promising signs of uh, the return on that investment in the performance of our students with literacy. Yep. Do you want to speak to that? No, um, thank you. Um, I think we are well positioned because of the time we have put in and the training we have done, the, the, small, the small moves that we've been able to make, I think um, have made a difference. and. There is nothing that breeds success like success, yes. right? So we have schools that have data that, I mean, teachers are clamoring to do more because they're seeing kids' data move. And there is nothing that is more exciting to a teacher than seeing a student go from not knowing to knowing, right? From not reading to reading. And so uh, the data is showing, and it's not, and I know somebody said, well, I haven't seen it in the SOL data yet. Well, because that doesn't start till third grade. So a lot of the data that we see, that impact of Lexia, we're seeing it more in our iReady results. Um, and other, other types of assessment. But yes, we are starting to see it. And we think that this, Basil, and trying to really ensure that we have that fidelity of, of um, practices across our schools, we'll start to see the greater groundswell. Well, I just appreciate all the work that you and others have done to, to make this happen. We have an happen. amazing team. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And if they're watching, I'm, we're here, I'm sure guys. they are. I mean, they're watching with popcorn <laughs> on Channel 99. Exactly, um, exactly. So we appreciate them as well. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Continuing on, I call on Ms. Marin for a motion. I jumped the gun, I forgot we had to go back. Dr. Anderson, sorry. It's okay, you can take it from over here. I'll just wait for you to get there. Thank you. Um, my next set of questions is really regarding some of the professional development plan that you've just shared. Um, one, I'd like to hear this from Dr. Reed. I'm sure you're going to have a dashboard for this. And can we get an update as a board in terms of where we are regarding the teacher training yes. as you have more and more teachers trained? I'm sure you have a few already. You have the big summer push. You'll have some folks that you'll gather throughout the year but what is the timeline that you, you expect for all teachers to be trained, and when will you be benchmarking um, where folks are? And well, I think you said 6,000 teachers. Well, you're correct. We uh, likely will have a dashboard that we'll be um, setting targets from. Uh, Ms. Klamenko, do you have a sort of a draft outline? Yeah, so um, we have enough seats this summer for 6,000 teachers, so if there's any teachers listening, we hope we would get the maximum number of teachers this summer, right? Because that, that time away from students, that three days, that focus would be great to capture the most. I said we're over 50% now. I'm, I, I think it will climb. We won't get to 100%, right? So then we have to kind of go into, hey, school starting mode, right? And so we have some plans in August to do some just-in-time training with the people who don't do um, the summer. 
and then we will have to do some rolling trainings, uh, whether we uh, utilize the reading specialist, whether we utilize our team, we'll have some different opportunities for people to capture the rest of the training. Just to be clear, as, as planned right now, oh, sorry, the three days are kind of a combination. Um, it's not just like, how do I, what are the materials? It's really, how do I use the materials? So it's two days, really, on the, focused on the new basal. Then we have some other components of the Virginia Literacy Act around assessment and reading plans that we'll spend the third day on. So some of it will be able to be chunked out throughout the year. We also know that we're going to need to, even those two days won't be enough. So there's going to be some ongoing things um, we're putting together. Not to go into too much detail, but we're, we're looking at some ideas like a core team. So have one first grade, one second grade, one third grade teacher that gets um, support at the beginning of each unit and then turns around to the team. So we're looking at multiple ways to support teachers um, as they move through it. Um, thank you, and I do look forward to whatever your dashboard yields. Um, speaking of training, we do know that in a lot of our schools, we have a high number of teacher residents, we have a high number of long-term subs and vacancies. How do we capture that group that tends to be pretty, you know, it fluctuates throughout the year? Are we even going to have a plan for that group of teacher residents and long-term subs? So we actually do have a plan to address, uh, in particular, provisional and teacher residents. I'm going to ask Ms. Neal to talk a little bit about um, the thinking around centrally deployed instructional coaches for the fall. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Um, at this time, we are going to be sharing some updates with schools that we have centrally funded um, instructional coaches who are currently deployed to schools who have needs, and we're going to be piloting um, starting next year. Um, an effort to recast their role to focus in on our novice teachers, our new teachers in years zero to three, um, to focus specifically at some of the things you're talking about, Dr. Anderson. So these instructional coaches will provide some sort of, I, I wouldn't think it's going to be as robust as the three-day, but some sort of orientation to these materials? They will be in classrooms with our new teachers, coaching them on a regular basis, modeling the types of teaching and learning and taking those things that are coming out of our instructional services department and our special services department to make sure our, our new teachers can implement those strategies. Sure, but I guess I'm asking for those long-term subs and teacher residents who are going to be embedded in the classrooms for some period of time, what will be their professional development with the materials compared to what our teachers are getting, this broad and expansive three-day experience or chunk throughout the year. I want to be sure that we're not losing that group because I have schools where there's a lot of teachers who are um, long-term subs or who are teacher residents, et cetera. And they're in front of our neediest kids. Yeah. So I want to make sure we're connecting those dots. So Dr. Anderson, one of the things I think that's a best practice um, is to make sure we also provide training for our substitutes. Uh, because anytime we put a new curriculum in place, we know that particularly those folks who are regularly in our classrooms really need to understand the rhythm and how to utilize those materials. So I would expect that Ms. Clemenko, Ms. Neal already are thinking about how to make sure we have opportunities for our substitutes to also be part of this training. And I would expect that these 21 already uh, hired, these are instructional coaches that are already in our division, that we're going to be deploying centrally for these provisional staff, I would expect they would also be in this three-day training so they are well aware of um, the instructional strategies and how to best utilize these resources. Okay. That would be an exciting thing if we had some sort of PD for our substitutes, particularly those that are in our building long terms or just very regular substitutes. Um, thank you for that. One of the things that you started to talk about, Ms. Kamenko, is the impact to the work of the teachers. I, I think I see this as an opportunity to take something off the plate, you know, because I see that every single teacher group is reinventing that same wheel. And we have the disparity in the product um, in the production of what they create because you have experienced teams and you have new teams and you have teams with a lot of long-term subs. So I think this is, this has the opportunity to be the great equalizer if all of those things regarding the training is true. Um, so Dr. Presidio, I think this is more of a question for you, I think, which is how do you perceive that your team will now support teachers if they're not creating those materials that they typically would have been creating for teachers to still 
architect to, to fit their needs in the classroom? Well, actually, I think their role <clears throat> will still be pretty similar because the curriculum development work is a pretty small piece, actually, uh, of the work that the resource teachers do. Most of the work that they do is through training and coaching and working with individual teachers and teams and schools. The curriculum development work typically happens in the summer, um, and that's a pretty small portion of what that work is. So those folks will be able to have more time and more capacity to, that, to do that coaching and support work. Now, of course, during the summer, they're gonna be doing a lot of professional development work with our teachers because, again, as Ms. Clemenko mentioned, there's gonna to need to be a lot of uh, professional development opportunities for teachers um, because not everybody's gonna be able to access those training opportunities at the same time. Thank you. That was your time, Dr. Anderson, thank you. All right, moving on, I uh, call on Ms. Marin for the motion. I move that the school board approves the purchase of Benchmark Advance 2022 as the Basal Instructional Resource for Elementary Language Arts. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is there a second? Second. Miss Lady. Uh, Miss Marin, would you like to speak to your motion? You know I do. So I'm ecstatic to vote to adopt this basal instructional resource um, that will be used next, next year in the fall. Thank you to the really countless hours over many years to those who made it happen. Ms. Noel Clemenko, Ms. Colleen Eddy, my constituent Diane Cooper Gould, Ms. Cheryl Brinkley out there, and so many others who viewed materials and gave input. I was delighted to view the materials prior to tonight's, tonight's vote, and let me tell you, they're really amazing. Um, and I say that as a school board member, as a professional in early literacy, and also as a parent with a dyslexic child. I think this, this instructional resource has something for everyone, both in the main um, materials and in the supplemental add-ons. So what this program does, as we've heard, is it instructs kids through the science of reading or the EBLI, I'm gonna start try to using that, which is proven to be the strongest approach in literacy mastery. And we know that research shows that if kids don't learn how to read by third grade, they will encounter difficulties not only in reading but in everything else in life. And unfortunately, we see that in our schools that, that kids who just simply can't communicate and read are acting in other ways to try and show themselves. And we need to help the, those students. 20% of the population in the US is dyslexic. This is not an, uh, you know, an unusual thing. People, some people have a, a difficulty learning to read and it's okay and we know how to help them. Um, what I also love is that this aligns literacy instruction across the school division for teaching strategies and for thematic content. So all of this content already aligns with the Virginia Standards of Learning. And while education is an art and science, as we heard, teachers sometimes they do want something that's a little bit more of that, you know, directed, hey, here's what you can use, and they will embellish it and make it their own because they're amazing educators. Um, this also is designed to build knowledge, vocabulary, and their perspectives via thematic units. I have loved the idea of thematic units since I first started working in this work in 2002 and saw amazing preschool work happening with kids from under-resourced communities who when you give them thematic content, they come alive, they get it, and it's real to them. So there's units, and the great thing is that the units happen across all the grade levels. So for instance, if you have your history, culture, and geography unit in kindergarten, you're also studying that in sixth grade. So if you have students in your family that are those ages, you could talk about the same kinds of things and make those connections. So I love that it, it also has a, an, an element to include our families, and I do want to be sure that our family um, uh, family liaisons are included in that training and able to communicate to families where they can find it, because that's how we really help the families to engage their learners. Um, it meets the requirements of the Virginia Literacy Act. I am remiss in thanking two delegates who helped brought that act to fruition. Our own Fairfax delegate, De Delegate Carrie Coiner, oh, excuse me, delegate, it's Carrie and Carrie, Delegate Carrie Delaney of Fairfax and Delegate Carrie Coiner from outside Fairfax who did an incredible job working bipartisanly to get this passed. And this is a, such a success for the state. It's a success story for what happens when the state supports public education. And I only hope that the governor who signed this into law can continue continue to look at what the state can do to be a leader when it comes to supporting our public education. Thank you so much for this hard work, and I definitely support this motion. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Ms. Lady, would you like to speak to your second? Yes, uh, I mirror this enthusiasm, um, and actually thank you to staff. I know how the hours, it's hours and hours and hours, and you, sometimes you feel like you're on a treadmill going nowhere. Um, but we got here, and, I, and I'm very excited about the product. Uh, the purchase of benchmark basal instructional resources, as Noel outlined and shared, it has sound pedagogy, aligns with letters, and the Virginia SOLs provide strong differentiation and cultural responsibility. 
It includes word recognition and language comprehension and builds skills across all areas of literacy. And I was, before Noelle said success breeds success, I just kept thinking, I was at Hutchinson Elementary today and I was in a room with kindergartners working on phonics, um, making connections. And you know, it, 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 when you see kids make connections and you see teachers' faces light up when their kids are learning, it's palpable. So I'm really excited about this. Thank you again for all the hard work and um, can't wait for our kids to get started next year. Thank you, Ms. Lady. I will call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion that's on the screen? Ms. Sizemore-Heiser, Mr. McDaniel, Mr. McElveen, Ms. Lady, Ms. St. John Cunning, Ms. Marin, Dr. Anderson, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Dixit, Mr. Moon, and myself. Will the clerk read the vote? That's 11-0. The motion uh, passes. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to Agenda item 4.03, action item, amending the school board's proclamation process. I call on Ms. Anderson for a motion. I move that the school board approve the changes to the strategic governance manual as detailed on board docs regarding the school board's proclamation process. Is there a second? Second. Mr. McDaniel. Ms. Anderson, would you like to speak to your motion? Quickly. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about why we are proposing to not speak to proclamations during our meeting. However, I did want to just say a few things. Um, all of us would love to speak to every proclamation that's brought forward. We all have things that we believe strongly and want to share. Many of our meetings go late into the night, which is a significant ask of our staff and community members, and we are cognizant of this. This, this move is not to quiet any voices that would want to support the amazing people and causes that we highlight as part of our proclamation process, it simply moves the discussion about proclamations to the board matters section of our meetings where time, when time allows or moves comments to our newsletters. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Mr. McDaniel? Also briefly, um, I agree with what was just said. Um, and and this, this tweak, uh, this change was part of a, a topic of discussion that we had during our retreat, and I think it was generally supported by members of the board. Um, and, and what I did with, with the Disability Awareness Month proclamation, I didn't make a comment. And I didn't make a comment because the wording in the proclamation is the comment. So that's another reason why I support this change. And to Ms. Anderson's point, if we want to elaborate further, uh, we can do that during our board matter time. So happy Thank to you. second. Thank you, Mr. McDaniel. Dr. Anderson? Thank you. Um, this is a place where the Andersons defer because I will not be supporting this um, pro this change. Obviously, there's some here. There's some things here that are not an issue. It is fine to change it from resolution to proclamation. That's not a concern for me at all. The concern for me is the part that we cannot make comments to to, to the proclamations. I'm, I'm looking at it tonight. I have prepared comments, but I'm going to look at what happened tonight. Tonight, when we had the women's um, the women's proclamation, when we had the disability proclamation, there were some beautiful things that you shared about your grandmother, Miss um, St. John Cummings. There were some beautiful things that you shared about your mother. There were some things that you shared, um, also Miss Lady, regarding even Dr. Reed that I did not know about. And it was a great opportunity to hear that, to, to understand that, to learn that, to have our community, because we had more people here at that time, to actually hear that. I, I understand there's a space here where we could put some things to board comments, but they get canceled, and nobody is here. And the whole idea of a proclamation is to really uplift and to elevate and to highlight and to recognize certain communities. And yes, we don't all have to speak to every proclamation. I certainly do not. But there are some proclamations which will really burn and hurt my heart to know that I can't speak to it while the people are here to be recognized. I'm, I'm thinking back to the one that I shared with Michelle Leak, where she was sitting here I'm sorry, she was not sitting here, but her family was sitting here. And there are some statements I won't put in a proclamation, but I would, it was wonderful to be able to highlight her daughter, Sydney, Sydney, just to be able to share that. I'm not going to write that in that proclamation. The soul of it is missing. I just really want us to be thinking about why do we even, why do we do these proclamations? It's to really uplift communities and groups that are not typically viewed and, and highlighted and recognized. And I think we're losing the soul. Like these stories that were told tonight, that will just, it diminishes, I think, the proclamation process. I think there's some spaces for us to do some other things. 
Yes, we have broad support for people not to speak the proclamation. Don't speak. But for the few people who want to speak, we should allow that. This enforced you know, censorship to save a few minutes, because I actually timed it tonight, and I timed it last time. It was not, I think, it, it was not enough time, I think, to warrant this. And when we have a situation where we're doing this and we're losing the opportunity to really highlight and recognize people who are not, who don't get that recognition on a regular basis, I think the juice is not worth the squeeze on this one at all. And going back to what we'll be doing in June, the Laura Ashley Award that we provide to our student, we don't get to speak to that. It just doesn't seem to be worth it for me. So this part for me does not really make sense. And even going back to one more point I want to make, now I'm going to go back to my thing here. Our proclamations, we typically vote on them before we get here. But what happens to the dissenting voice? What if somebody does not agree? Then they have no space to speak before they vote, which we always have space to, to speak before we vote. This one doesn't work, folks. I hope we can rethink it. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Seeing no others, I will call for the vote. All those in favor of the motion on the screen? Ms. Sizemore Heiser, Mr. McDaniel, Ms. Lady, Ms. St. John Cunning, Ms. Marin, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Uh, Dixit, and myself. All those opposed? Mr. McElveen, Dr. Anderson, Mr. Moon. Will the clerk read the vote? The vote is eight yeses, three noes. The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, agenda item 6.01, performance review, financial planning, EL5 monitoring report. I call on Dr. Reed. Oh, who is right there? Okay. Thank you, uh, Chair Frisch. So I'll be presenting the EL5 in a different format this evening. We thought it might be helpful. Uh, you have the monitoring report in front of you. Uh, and the monitoring report, for those at home watching, is attached to board docs. But we uh, thought we would try some slides to make it a little more engaging. Um, not that financial planning wouldn't be engaging in and of itself, uh, but we thought that it could be helpful this evening. So thank you for queuing that up. And we'll start with, oh, I almost tripped over the stool here. <laughs> I've, anyhow, um, we'll start with um, the slide that pretty much talks about um, the financial planning expectation here. And at the time of this report, I want to share that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, information and belief, I do believe we've gathered information that supports compliance with the board's expectation in this particular executive limitation. Although I'm only going to be sharing selected indicators in the PowerPoint, um, the entire report is available again and attached to uh, our board docs um, platform. So the four main areas, if we want to move the slide forward, thanks. Um, Kevin, so the four main areas are number one, well you can read them on the screen. Uh, these are essentially the areas that the board called out as most critical with rela uh, relationship to family planning. So as we walk through these, I wanna take a look at number one, um, which is clear around developing an annual budget that has these specific A through K indicators. Um, and this is the first part of this particular executive limitation is the budget development process. I want to note that um, there's a lot of excitement, I think, among our budget team uh, about recognitions uh, that the team has received. And these are really important because they illustrate the level of transparency our division for many years has illustrated. The ASBO, which is the Association of School Business Officials and the Government Finance Officers, GFOA, um, awards are really all around financial transparency and reporting. So there's a lot of excitement uh, in receiving those awards and they're not an insignificant amount of work necessary to achieve that level of recognition. I want to remind the board that we've kept to an annual budget calendar and this again is critical and it's shared with employees and the community in a transparent way viewed, um, it's connected on the website uh, via the budget area it's also shared on employee news, the division newsletter, 
and all budget documents are available to the public throughout the entire uh, budget cycle. The fiscal, fiscal forecast is where we start with the annual budget. This occurs um, for FY25 for this year. It occurred this past November, and it included the preliminary summary of projected state and federal revenue. Of course, uh, our state revenue was not what we had expected or projected, but this was our first uh, stab at this in November of 23. As we then know, the next major step is to prepare the proposed budget. And this proposed budget is a budget that's shared with the school board, um, which is a student-focused, equitable, and by statute needs-based proposed budget for FY 2025. This year, we aligned it to our strategic plan, and the priorities outlined included, most specifically, workforce recruitment and retention to include competitive compensation, student academic success and access, access to enrichment and mental health supports, as well as the closing of achievement gaps, school safety and security, the maintenance or lowering of class sizes and accelerating expansion of preschool options, and um, many, um, anyhow, I'll leave that there. Secondly, uh, the development of an annual budget, we looked at the operating funds. So there is a school operating fund revenue section, which introduces various revenue streams and then provides details for each stream as to the historical fiscal contribution. And we have a school operating fund expenditure section, which provides detailed guidance on how revenue is budgeted and allocated to specific areas of operations, such as salaries, employee benefits, and additional operating expenses. I tried to work a few more charts in um, this presentation. Next, we looked at how the budget aligned with our strategic plan um, alignment, in particular, our four pillars of our strategic plan. So the percentages are broken out and we made these transparent um, to our staff and our community. One of the things that I wanna share is that there was a follow-on motion from the board on January 25th that requested recommendations for a comprehensive and cyclical efficiency review. And it's been my recommendation, I sent a note, I think that it had to be sent out to you by close of business February 29th. So on February 29th last week, you did receive a note from me outlining a memo uh, recommending that after looking at all our options, I felt like it would be most prudent for us as a division to seek the Baldrige Award for performance excellence. I think this will enable us to look at our budget from an efficiency standpoint <coughs> and also an effectiveness standpoint. We could have a very efficient budget that doesn't effectively lead us to the return on investment that we expect in student outcomes. And I believe it's all of our intent as well as our community's expectation that our budget not only be efficient but also lead to effective outcomes for our young people. Our annual budget development also includes reserves and these are reserves, uh, there are four of them in our school um, operating fund and these include <coughs> the four that are named above. The school board flexibility reserve also is committed to meet unforeseen circumstances. And these could be anything because they're unforeseen. Um, so I can't predict what they are. I know it's a spoiler alert. Um, anyhow, so developing an annual budget, the school board office also provides executive administrative and tech support to all of the members of the board. Um, this, this office is responsible for maintaining official exhibit files of all school board meetings and historical legal records. The responsibilities also include compiling and publishing agendas, agenda items, posting um, a variety of coordination tasks, maintenance and posting of all current policies, regulations, and notices to the website. So number two of our four is providing the board with a multi-year plan. This plan, <clears throat> the second requirement, is um, a critical component of the financial planning process, and there are multiple aspects I'll address this evening. First of all, we um, wanna make sure that we share multi-year plans through a fiscal forecast that's included in each approved budget. And this is the one from our FY24 um, budget which provides detailed revenue and expenditure assumptions with projections through FY 2027. 
The current projections go three years into the future, and we're going to be exploring ways to have a five-year out in future budget documents. Right now, to go five years out, it doesn't, uh, we feel like we want to make sure these are real uh, possible uh, projections, and right now we feel confident with three, but we're working on ways to make that five. <clears throat> we also consider school department and enrollment needs as part of our multi-year planning efforts, uh, including projected school and departmental staffing needs, as well as state staffing standards. So we're always looking at those, and I want to share that Fairfax County Public Schools have traditionally maintained, um, I would consider, more um, effective standards uh, than the state um, standards. And I think that's probably true across the Commonwealth, that the SOQs don't fully fund what's really necessary to provide the world-class education we expect here. I also want to mention that uh, the percentage of students um, has really increased in the last five years uh, in terms of those students eligible for free or reduced price meals um, in particular. So let's take a look at student enrollment because, of course, this is a big driver in budget planning. And this financial process definitely takes the number of students enrolled into consideration, as well as forecasted changes in enrollment and the needs of those students who are in our enrollment numbers. Here we can see the projected and actual enrollment from 2019 through 2025. And I think one of the things that's also interesting to note, it's kind of small print, so if you're at home, you might need to squint a little. Uh, but our actual enrollment as of February, this uh, past February, was 182, 182,414. So <clears throat> we are continuing to grow this year, which I think is a great sign for our community. Looking at the uh, multi-year enrollment and per pupil costs, the FY25 proposed budget provides information on cost per pupil as well as cost per service. Shown here is the FY24 WAVY comparison uh, that compares <coughs> FCPS to other school divisions when looking at the cost per pupil that we're spending. And as you look at that, uh, there are many divisions spending more per pupil um, than we are. So it's, again, um, just a, a data point that we utilize in our uh, financial planning and something we've talked about with our Board of Supervisors and our state delegates, our delegation in terms of budget needs. Next, um, our capital improvement plan is part of the fiscal forecast. Um, again, the fiscal forecasts are projected in the CIP to ensure that school construction projects remain well resourced. The SIP program uh, funding provides a summary of needs for five years and an overview explanation of the cost analysis um, and outlines projected costs to support school capacities for increased student enrollment. Upcoming draft reports will provide courses of action to maximize current funding also and um, investigate new streams of funding. So other ongoing multi-year efforts include uh, systemic annual cyclically or cyclical reviews of job classifications. Sounds a little redundant, uh, but we're building in the cyclical review and that was part of our budget. Uh, plan and again, it's part of our planning moving forward so we can make sure that all job, job categories are reviewed on a regular basis. Also, it <coughs> ensures that relevant investment needs are clearly identified and outlined, um, as well as identifying unfunded obligations uh, because we are required to comply with federal and state mandates, often without adequate funding. I think Mr. Moon mentioned that this evening with our literacy materials. The state, at the end of the day, has only really paid 20% of what it's going to cost us to purchase materials for our upcoming initiative in that area. I want to remind our board and those watching from home that the advocacy for funding with the legislature, again, continues to be important um, with the Seminole report on the JLARC study. And quite honestly, um, I just really hope people are thoughtful about looking at this and actually paying attention to it because at the end of the day, we have world-class expectations and we, we absolutely need to fund those. Number three of four is providing timely advice to the board, which allows the board adequate time to consider the information. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, <coughs> per 
First, it's important to note that the annual budget process is outlined ahead of time and uh, calendared to allow ample time and opportunity for collaboration and feedback with a variety of stakeholders. We've had joint meetings with the Fairfax County Board of Su Supervisors, public hearings, question and answers, and our qu budget question process. <coughs> <coughs> Additionally, we have quarterly budget reviews that are conducted and made publicly available. So there's uh, many, there are many opportunities for input, feedback, and collaboration. Lastly, <clears throat> number four is uh, states that I shall not take or not fail to take all reasonable, prudent, anticipatory, and proactive um, actions in securing financial resources for the division from relevant funding and revenue sources. And I'd really like this evening to highlight our quarterly budget review process, which consists of a grants development component. And this includes updates on the status of grants within the current fiscal year and the prior fiscal year, when that's applicable. So the summary shows which grants we've submitted, um, which are pending, have been awarded or were denied, as well as the name and amount of each at the end of third quarter in FY24. And at this time, Mr. Chairman, this concludes the summary of the monitoring report for executive limitation number five, financial planning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed. All right, I call on Dr. Anderson. Thank you very much for this. This was an interesting one, uh, particularly being in the role of uh, budget chair this year. So a lot of this was very familiar. Um, I do want to say, um, first of all, kudos to the team for those awards that you are typically been awarded every single year because your budget practices and, um, are top of the industry standard. So kudos, because I don't think, Ms. Uh, Burden, can you say how many years running those awards have been provided or you, your team has won those awards? <laughs> yeah, we started applying for the ASBO uh, certification and the GFOA back in 1998, and we have received the ASBO award for the last 26 years running. Um, the GFOA award, we have paused on that during, well, during COVID, and we're going to start that back up, but that also started in 1998, so about 22 years okay. of the GFOA, and we'll begin that again for fiscal 25. So it's been a long time, and that's wonderful. I do really want to highlight the areas where I saw just really significant strengths, and I kind of break up my document, as you probably saw from the last one. I outline each of the indicators. Indicator one, I thought, was a huge strength. I, I have a lot of evidence that I have been able to find um, regarding um, the planning, the scheduling, all of that is clear and it's repeated. The collaboration with the Board of Supervisors, um, the response of the Board's resolution, I, I've appreciated that because I think that was one of the pieces that we have not had um, in the years past because we've had this resolution, this is our third year, and this is, right? and roughly, but this is the first time where there's been a very clear um, response to each of the components, so thank you for that. Um, one of the pieces in that first section, which is 1C, um, budget being easily accessible, transparent, and understandable to the community. I fully agree, it is available, it is transparent, but I am not sure that it's as understandable to the public as we would like, and I, I don't have a real way to make that easier, but I do want to raise it because continuously we get from the public, I want to figure out what this is. And they have a hard time navigating that 500 page book. And it's a big budget, so it's going to have a lot of pages, but I know that piece wouldn't ring true with the feedback that I've received. Um, but the other two pieces, you guys have a lot of things available on the website. Um, one of the areas, and I want to make sure I stick to my time that I think is the one of the greatest growth is probably number two, the multi-year plan. I, I definitely see that the CIP provides that five-year look, which is ahead, and I may be working with a different definition than you are um, regarding items, you know, 2A to 2F. I, I was thinking that that plan that you talked about um, would hit all of these different components. We definitely have the fiscal, the three-year revenue um, document that you provided, 
but I, I was not able to find where we had that multi-year plan that um, showed, looking ahead, the needs of the, um, of the schools and departments. I definitely saw the staffing um, ratio in the books as you have articulated, but I was not able to see the evidence of those two, of those other areas, and maybe I missed it, and I would love to be sent to the right place. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. <clears throat> Ms. Dixit. Thank I didn't you, Mr. Know the, Chair. Uh, I didn't, Dr. Reed. One second, Ms. Dixit. Okay. I didn't hear a question, but would you like to respond to the statement? <clears throat> sure. I sure. Um, I think you didn't see it because it's not there. Um, what we've done is we've plan what we took is the division level data, and we haven't uh, run that for all 200 schools um, or all the departments yet. And it does say consider the needs of schools and departments. So what we did, I think, is take it at a relatively high level. Um, to look at the three year out, um, and I'll ask Ms. Burden for any additional comment on that particular score. No, you're absolutely right okay. that we, you know, it's pretty high level, the entire operating fund, not the, the level of detail that it's asking for here. I, I will say that I think as we move forward with um, this executive limitation and with that feedback, we can mock up a model that we can look at. Um, populating for the next cycle. So I appreciate the feedback. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Ms. Dixit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Reed, uh, so one of the points uh, Dr. Anderson just made about the dash, the, the visibility of the data and uh, the budget, um, not a lot of people are very good with numbers financially and just to understand the document. Um, and when you were saying presenting that, I was thinking about uh, how a dashboard would be helpful to uh, create it on your the FCPS budget website, and then it can link to different things. But overall, some people can see the graphics and understand it more. I am not clearly how it's going to work out, but that's something uh, to explore. I think Fairfax County government uses the dashboard model I think we saw that in one of, one of their presentation when we were at the uh, at a joint session. So that's a possibility. Yes, ma'am. We'll Thank take you. a look at that. I do remember that. It was a, um, we can take a look at that. Thank you very much. Seeing no others, we will move on to the motion. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Ms. Anderson, I guess I should put these back on. Um, while I was teaching at Kansas State, I had the joy of teaching my favorite students ever, which were in the engineering department. And one of the things that I did as liaison with the English department is I went in and I actually worked with students related to Baldridge. And oh. I had student groups that were working on Baldridge Award applications for their particular departments. So I know a little bit about the mm -hmm. Baldridge process. So could you speak to a little bit about how you see us working with them in that amazing framework? <laughs> I can. I, um, I really feel like it's a much more aspirational way of approaching really what you've asked for, which is a review of efficiencies. I think the follow-on motion um, was really thoughtful, right? We are responsible for a lot of money, and it's really our community's money. And I always take more seriously money that I'm responsible for in that sense. And those resources really are what are gonna support the education of our future, you know, our children, and making sure that we're wise stewards of those funds for our students, staff, families, and community is just a really important responsibility that we, not, that we can't take lightly. I think the Baldrige Award provides an opportunity for us to look at all aspects of the division. It's very structured. It's not a, it's a very disciplined approach over the indicators, I believe there's seven, um, it looks at all aspects of the division and allows us to really identify is the money and how we're spending the money and how we're making those decisions leading to the outcomes that we expect for our children, which is really our strategic plan. So I'm really looking forward to it being a piece that connects the strategic plan to our resources. It's based on a needs-based allocation model. And it should allow us, I think, when we do this well, to make better decisions on behalf of our students as well. So I'm just 
I'm thrilled with that possibility, um, and I'm looking forward to the, the work and the process. I just wanted to say that I wholeheartedly agree with all of that, and yeah. it's a heavy lift. Um, it is. It, but this process was always going to be a heavy lift to look at the different components right. of what we're doing. Right. So I think using it within that framework of looking towards excellence and, and what Baldridge does particularly well is help you formulate the questions that you need in right. order to get to the next level. So I love that we're going to utilize a framework that exists. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Mr. Moon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just two areas for questions. Uh, first one, I think I understand what you said about a, having a multi-year plan this time. This year was just the three years, but you want to end up going forward, you'll be able to provide five-year fiscal projections. Yes, sir. Uh, it was one of the reasons why we are only able to do three years this year is upcoming, potentially, collective bargaining, how that's going to affect. I don't think that was really, um, it's certainly a factor that's going to be new for us. I think traditionally in the division we've only done three years. I don't think we've ever done five years. And I think when we looked at that, um, that was the response. Ms. Burden, you want to help me with that historical perspective? Yeah, the, um, the governor, the, the awards for, from ASBO and GFOA require that we provide three years three future years, and so that's what we have provided for some time now. For the last uh, quarter century, I yeah. think. Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. I, I get that, I get that. However, but this is in now executive limitations. I know. For you the five years. Yes, that sir. I didn't, I didn't make that decision. But, uh, but okay, so that was, you know, one of the things I wondered as I was reviewing. So, well, did okay. I miss this five-year projection? No, nope, it's only three. Okay. And the next question is a little more, a little more tricky one because, you know, obviously, uh, you know, there is a gap between our advertised budget in terms of what you are asking from county side and when the county executive has proposed, uh, and there's a ninety million dollar gap. And if I look at the executive implementation. Uh, number five under one B, it is, it is a develop an annual budget that is based on realistic assumptions and a current and ongoing assessment of local, state, and federal funding sources. We rely on county board of supervisors for almost 70% right. of our funding. And when there is a $90 million of a gap like that, mm -hmm. did you think? What kind of realistic assumptions did you make in coming up with your proposed, and we both did you responsible for passing it? So that is my biggest question at this point. And I'm also looking at, I was also looking at uh, that PowerPoint presentations that was given to both school board and county supervisors back in, November 28th, 2023, I was not part of that board. At the time, there were some assumptions, assumptions from school side, which were different from the ones you presented. For example, you had, we only had, you know, back in November 28th, $17.1 million for enrollment and student needs, whereas I think it's a 40 some million dollars right. in, in your budget. So, so I'm talking about how those numbers came about and why the new numbers are so different from those numbers going back to November 28th. So great questions. And I'm gonna <clears throat> start by saying that uh, I believe the budget I presented was a needs-based budget. And again, I think that Fairfax County Public Schools we are a world-class division and we have to pay our educators in a world-class fashion. There's just not a, um, and I don't think our board, nor I, nor probably anyone in the room is gonna um, think that that's not a needs-based budget at this point. I think that's a critical uh, cornerstone, really, of the work we're doing moving forward. I will say that what we did in planning the budget is we sat down and looked at what was the historic percentage that we receive from Fairfax County Board of Supervisors in terms of the transfer, uh, the percentage of revenues. 
And so what we know over the last five years is we've received 52.6% of those revenues as our transfer. And in fact, over the last 10 to 15 years, that number was larger than 52.6%. In uh, actuality, what's happened, as we've calculated that, is that it's only 51.4% at this time, and had it been the 52.6 that we would have expected in the planning cycle, that would be $63 million more million right now in the transfer from the county, which would have taken us above $200, uh, 200 million in the transfer. Then we really projected the state to provide, based on early indications, about, I want to say, Lee, I think I texted this evening, we were hoping um, for another 40 million-ish from the state. Uh, we expected, um, so the actual transfer request in the planned budget that I presented to the board, the proposed budget, was well within reason in uh, my thinking and planning early on. I will say that the numbers from the fiscal forecast to the proposed budget um, I know we took another look at enrollment. If you go back to our enrollment chart, uh, we've tended to level off more during the years, and this year we've actually continued to grow. Uh, in February, I believe we were um, larger than we were in February 2020 even. So the growth has kind of surprised us over the course of this year. But I'll let Ms. Burden maybe make a more specific comment in that uh, specific number that you asked for the shift. So Ms. Burden? Um, as far as the fiscal forecast goes, um, you would know, but we present that to the school board in early October, and at that point, we don't have enrollment projections for the upcoming year, so the number that we used um, was just a guess. We continued to have, you know, our special populations, um, EL kids, uh, FRM kids, and special education kids that grew faster than our general education. But at the time of the fiscal forecast, we don't have any enrollment data because the, enrollment, the planning department, when they project enrollment, you know, they use the September 30. But it's, it's, it's as of September 30, but it's not actually due to the state until mid-October because it has to be reconciled and checked and all that. And so at the time we presented to the, the fiscal forecast to the school board, we don't actually have enrollment projections. In addition to that, it's as Dr. Uh, Reed indicated, the um, state revenue historically had been far greater uh, due to re-benchmarking and some of the items that we saw go way down uh, with the governor's introduced budget. But at that time, of course, we did not have any state revenue information back in October for the upcoming year. So we made an estimate and it ended up being far less than that, which increased our ask to the um, county. Okay, uh, you know, Dr. Reed, I, I appreciate your answers. However, I mean, I still uh, wonder why this joint meeting with the supervisors was November 28th, only a little more than a month and a half before you had your numbers, new numbers. But because county supervisors are looking at this, 17.1 million for enrollment and student needs. Mm -hmm. Our new number is 46. Mm -hmm. That's an almost difference of $30 million. Mm -hmm. That's a huge chunk. So, it is. you know, if you weren't sure about the numbers back in November, you should, we should have told supervisors that those are numbers from nowhere. Well, I don't think they were numbers from nowhere. Um, the, uh, the calculation of the 17 versus the 30, do you have a better explanation, Lee, on that? Yeah, it's, it's just a timing problem. I mean, we, this is one of the challenges that we have every year that oftentimes by the time, you know, we, we, we don't want to, of course, get out in front of the school board, so we do the fiscal forecast. We present it to them in October. The fiscal forecast joint meeting with the Board of Supervisors is always the last week of November. And so I always have difficulty with that because by the time we present it, I know better information. But I can't, I can't provide that information because the fiscal forecast that we did back in October is the official one, and that is the one that we're presenting to the Board of Supervisors. So it's always a little bit difficult because we do have better information by November 28th, but we're not going to announce that, and the school board has no idea 
as to what that new information is. And certainly, we don't want to usurp the superintendent's proposed budget process either. I think perhaps what I'm hearing, because I think there's been a process that sort of has certain pragmatic steps, right? And the type of data we have early in October really evolves over the course of time. And in this case, I think perhaps this is an opportunity for us to sit down and look at, do we want to look at this differently moving forward? But I think uh, for this year, we followed the process that's traditionally been followed. My time is up, so I'm going to refrain from asking more questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moon. I call on... Ms. Sizemore Heiser for a motion. Thank you. I move that the board find that the superintendent has made adequate progress towards compliance with EL5. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Ms. Sizemore Heiser, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, I would. And I appreciate all of my colleagues' questions um, around this EL. This is the first year we're presenting right. this um, in a new process. And I, I frankly love the transparency mm -hmm. in terms of laying out what we expect for you from financial planning and laying out where our process has been, which gives us, I think, new room to look at the process from fresh eyes. And I want to really thank staff for their hard work in putting this together and all the hard work in doing this. So thank you, Ms. Bird, Ms. Whittington, and your her staff as well. Um, I, I, I believe you made adequate progress towards this goal. I believe you made good progress towards this goal. There is a lot here that you have, including a multi-year plan, a fiscal forecast. I know it's three years this year, but building towards that five years. Um, I really appreciate the fact that what you're presenting to us fits with what we're asking for, which is student-focused, needs-based, reasonably aligned to our resources, focusing on instruction, compensation, and aligned to the strategic plan. I think those are all really, really important pieces. And I think the fact that you're, this budget is almost entirely focused on instruction and changing enrollment needs and on compensation in an era of staffing shortages, don't worry about what's going on over there, <laughs> I think is really, really important and vital. So I appreciate that. And just to um, piggyback on what Ms. Anderson said, um, in response to that follow-on motion, which I think was very thoughtful, but also a, a really big lift to come back with a plan. I really appreciate that we're um, looking to use a Baldridge Awards for performance excellence process. Um, because not only does it look at efficiency, it looks at effectiveness, yep. and it leaves room for us to be innovative and excellent, right? Like being efficient without being excellent isn't necessarily the right thing, right? right. Um, and being effective and inefficient isn't necessarily the right thing. But excellence requires effectiveness, um, efficiency, and a level of aspiration. Right, we don't, we want to be the best, we are, and that's, this framework allows us to do that. So I think this is a great response to um, the follow-on motion as well as the high standards that it sets. And I, I like the fact that there's a very clear process we can follow in um, applying this to this follow-on motion and really looking at our return on investment, our kiddos learning, and, it, and, um, and it's not just a process that's, Tailor for education. It's a process that's used by effective organizations right. in a variety of industries. So I think that is wonderful. I do think that going through the exercise of the EL and the presentation has showed us some opportunity, I think. And I think that's always good because when, we're, when you've been doing something in a similar way for many years, sometimes you don't think about looking at it from a new lens. And so I think this EL has given us a chance to look at some of these things from a new lens. Um, I look forward to a five-year fiscal forecast. Um, I hear this, the struggles with enrollment, and I think maybe there's an opportunity to even look at even earlier on, not just right. projected enrollment, but projected student need along with enrollment, right? right? So we have an, an idea, because I think that's some of the biggest challenges here. It's not just the enrollment, but it's the shifting need of our students. Right. So um, having said that, I, I really appreciate the, this is quite a lengthy and detailed EL, and I appreciate the, um, the quite the information that you have provided um, to answer each one of the questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, your staff, and look forward to building on this excellent work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Ms. Marin, would you like to speak to your second? <clears throat> Just briefly, I'll say that I see evidence of fiscal oversight, frugality where possible, but high impact investments. Uh, the evidence even tonight that you forward thought to fund our basal resources is clearly um, just the latest, little, really latest example of the um, financial oversight. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Seeing no others, uh, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion on the, ta on the uh, screen, please raise your hand. Ms. Sizemore-Heiser, Mr. McDaniel, Mr. I can't see if his hand is up or not. Okay. Miss Lady, Miss St. John Cunning, Miss Marin, Dr. Anderson, Miss Anderson, Miss Dixit, and myself. All those opposed? Abstentions? Mr. McElveen and Mr. Moon. Will the clerk read the vote? That's nine yeses, no noes, two abstentions. The motion carries. Thank you. At this time, the board will take a few moments to document their individual feedback on this report. School board members may complete the hard copy found at the dais um, or the online form linked in the meeting script. If you have any issues accessing the online form, please contact the clerk. The board will now take a 10 minute recess. This is not on. Is it?
Board members, please return to your seats. Board members, please return to your seats. Board members, please return to your seats. All right, we have quorum at the dais, so we will continue. The next order of business is agenda item 7.03, policy review, financial planning, EL5. Following the board's vote in September 2023 and our vote at our February 8th, 2024 regular meeting, each year the board will review each of the 13 executive limitations at the time of the monitoring report is provided to determine if any revisions are needed moving forward. The board may also review any of the executive limitations at any time as needed. At this time, board members may provide comments on executive limitations number five, financial planning to determine if any revisions are necessary. Uh, as a reminder, as I just said, um, you're welcome to bring these suggestions at any time. Uh, in fact, if you do have suggestions, you can workshop them with your colleagues in advance of meetings like this one so that everybody's prepared to have that conversation. All right, I call on Mr. McElveen for a motion. I move that the school board maintain executive limitation five, financial planning, as it is currently detailed in the strategic governance manual. Yeah. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Anderson. Mr. McElveen, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, no, thanks. Thank you. Ms. Anderson, would you like to speak to your second? No, thank you. Thank you. Um, we will go ahead and go to a vote for the motion that is on the screen. All those in favor of the motion on the screen, raise your hand. Ms. Sizemore Heiser, Mr. McElveen, Ms. Lady, Ms. St. John Cunning, Ms. Marin, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Dixit, Mr. Moon, and myself. Uh, that's unanimous for everybody at the table. All right. Item 801, Academic Matters. I call on Dr. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, it's time for academic matters. So, lots of excitement this evening as we talk about literacy development for our multilingual learners. 
Um, you're going to hear a little bit different language about um, our multilingual learners. We've had some conversations and I'll be sharing some thoughts about that in my weekly uh, reflections about uh, how language matters in terms of how we uh, talk about our students and the strengths they bring to uh, the educational experience that we all get to share. So this evening, I am thrilled to be talking about uh, literacy development, uh, particularly on the evening where you've adopted uh, the language arts basil. Uh, I want to thank um, the staff that was part of that work. It's incredible work, very thoughtful work. And also want to thank staff um, this evening uh, for putting together this presentation. One of the things that um, is important for you to know, and I think this evening we made very clear, is that we're going to make sure that we're going to be providing materials from the Basel curriculum for the over 20% of our students who are multilingual learners. Um, so we're really excited, um, and we're going to focus on the work we're doing to support our multilingual learners this evening. So as we move to the first slide, and for those of you at home, this is attached. Uh, to board docs. So one of the things we want to talk a little bit about is our multilingual student uh, demographics. And you can see the demographic data from January of 2024. Again, we are now at 182.414. January 2024, we were at, at this particular moment, 182.254. The largest circle, of course, that's represented. The next circle includes um, students with a home language that's other than English, and not all students that have a home language other than English are necessarily identified as multilingual learners for purposes of extra support. That would be that smaller circle, and just noting that as of January 31st here in Fairfax County Public Schools, we had 38,000 students who are identified as multilingual students and also receiving special supports in our county at levels one through four. One of the things that is really exciting, of course, is our equitable access to literacy plan. And this evening, one of the notes I took was that we want to make sure our parents are also very aware and including family liaisons in the training and materials. So hopefully we're also, I know we're likely planning parent activities to share um, lots of excitement about that. But these high expectations that our bold new literacy plan is going to um, be nurturing are really for each and every one of our students. So we want to make sure that everyone understands we have the same high expectations for all our learners. And we're going to be continuing to provide strong supports for our multilingual learners. So one of the simple view of reading uh, for all multilingual learners is there, and I had to work some math in here. Um, so we have some math. Um, word recognition times language comprehension equals reading comprehension, right? So if we think about that, the word recognition really allows that oral language fluency. Uh, if you've ever worked with a struggling secondary reader, uh, often the fluency level, it takes so long sometimes to sound out words and get through a sentence, you really lose the meaning and comprehension becomes more difficult. So we're really um, noting that our multilingual learners really have a much greater emphasis on this oral language development, um, which then supports the reading comprehension. It's really important uh, for both our classroom teachers and our teachers who work more traditionally with uh, multilingual learners. Uh, most recently, I know um, Dr. Rich Polio is sharing with us that 89% of every teacher in our division works with a multilingual learner. And that number continues to rise. And as we think about that, that makes it really critical that all of our staff understand how effective strategies for multilingual learners are as we make sure that uh, students are able to thrive in every course. The specific literacy support for English learners um, and multilingual students is, has to be in from, um, explicitly taught um, and interactive practices. Uh, but this really explicit instruction in English language is critical to support literacy development. And the new tools that you approved this evening will really uh, provide those opportunities for our multilingual learners. Uh, visuals, colors, charts, 
Uh, anytime we can encourage and increase student voice and student talk in the classroom, again, is very important. Uh, the picture you see uh, in front of you on this slide is from another new promising practice here, which is Project GLAD, and it's really identifying those GLAD strategies and integrating those really in every uh, content area and instructional strategy that we've utilized, and it's a best practice multilingual language strategy. So, I want to share a little bit about that. Um, again, GLAD stands for Guided Language Acquisition Design. And um, this will really help support our teachers, uh, particularly teachers maybe who haven't had multilingual students in the past because our multilingual student population is growing. Uh, so some, in some cases, we have staff learning these strategies to be better able to um, connect with students. Currently in Fairfax County, we have over 300 teachers that have been trained, and we're, we have more staff scheduled for training in the future. So um, this evening, you're really getting kind of a double dose here of Tier 1 and Tier 2 on our basal resources. Uh, but the core resources are an essential practice for integrating the English language development across the curriculum. <coughs> And as, I, as Ms. Klamenko indicated, we are going to also be uh, purchasing English language development resources so that we have a seamless integration and connection between our multilingual services and our classroom and content learning. It's going to be very important. Finally, I want to end with uh, reminding our community that our multilingual learners are on a journey um, and they're simultaneously increasing their proficiency in English while they are also learning new grade level content. And I think about that, um, you know, having a first language and learning a new language is such a strength. Um, and many of our students speak multiple languages, not just two. Um, and it's just uh, an opportunity though to also think about the content knowledge they need to be acquiring at that same time. So. One of the things <coughs> we know is that <coughs> the more time English learners have practicing English, the better they perform academically. So as our multilingual learners have a better grasp of the English language, they're able to perform better in content areas. So um, that is academic matters this evening, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Reed. I call on Dr. Anderson. Thank you. I'm happy to start with this chart because I think it's a very powerful one. It really speaks to the fact that not having English as a, not being proficient in English is a temporary state because we right. see the trajectory is exactly where we want it to be. And exactly. our students who are former ELLs are performing at the same level as our students who have never been ELLs. So that is something I think we cannot. Um, emphasize and share right. enough because I, I think it's uplifting. There is light right. at the end of that tunnel because sometimes it is not seen that students who don't have language proficiency yet in English can perform at a high level and we're seeing that they can. I think what you're saying is so important because sometimes I think we have different expectations and when you look at this chart we have to remember we have to maintain the same high expectations for each and every one of our students. The level of support which goes to some of the budget differential in terms of increasing numbers of students who are multilingual who may need more support. And when we provide it, they are capable of achieving um, everything that they had hoped to. Absolutely, thank you. On chart five, we talked about the literacy support for English teachers. Who is receiving this? Is this elementary, primary, or is it across the board, K-12? Uh, at this time, it's been at 27 Title I schools, which all of our Title I schools, except one, I think, are elementary. So I'm guessing this is primarily an elementary, but I'm going to defer to... Right, yeah, sure. uh, we have two middle schools that are Title I. Rich? That's right. So this, well, the particular strategy that we showed in the, I believe it's slide six, uh, about Project GLAD, that is what we're focused on Title I schools. However, the strategies that Dr. Reed shared and that you're noticing on slide five are strategies that, that our office and that we train all teachers in uh, across uh, in K-12. So these are strategies that um, teachers receive training either from their school-based uh, instructional coaches or lead teachers, 
we're also looking at um, more other than Project Glad, there are other, such as uh, many people have talked about PSYOP training in the past, mm -hmm. there is a, so we are looking into other professional development models that we can use because, you know, as Ms. Kalenko mentioned earlier, 6,000 elementary teachers, we have you know, 11,000 teachers, uh, over 11,000 teachers total. This is also a, a long-term goal of training all teachers in these strategies. Okay, so, I, that, so that's an expectation. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what I'm gonna <laughs> here's what I'm gonna say. Um, I believe that, uh, and we've taken this, we've used this as an example in our academy classes. Uh, we had some of our music teachers came forward and said we want to have some of our classes back in academy classes for credit. And what we've said is, if you include inclusive strategies within the course you want for credit within the academy for teachers earning, um, I don't know what they're called here, clock hours, um, some kind of continuing Seems. credit hours. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I would expect is that when we present our new basal reading literacy curriculum professional development, that these strategies should be embedded and included within that professional development. In other words, I don't think we have time, nor do our staff have the energy to take multiple types of professional mm -hmm. development. So my expectation would be that our universal design for learning strategies, the GLAD strategies are embedded, integrated, and part of how we present, how we're gonna be presenting the new basal uh, curriculum. So rather than have multiple classes to sign up, that's just gonna be how we do our work. Well, that definitely makes it more efficient right. because time is of the essence. And I, I think former board member Omei, she will be <laughs> so pleased right. to hear that the right. universal design, the UDL, is going to be part right. of, of this training. Um, just dropping down to slide six um, that talks about the guided language acquisition design. You mentioned that um, this is targeting the 27 Title I schools. How many teachers are we looking at to be trained in GLAD? Because I see how many we have so far but how many more do we have to go? I can't tell you the exact total number of Title I teachers, but I know right now we are working on, we have a plan for 300 additional teachers next year. We're basically working with one grade level at a time at multiple schools. So sometimes two grade levels per school. Um, and so it will take a few years, but we have, we're, we are uh, continuing with Project GLAD. We're all in with Project GLAD for now for the next few years. Okay, so you said it will take a few years. What do we anticipate that timeline being? Five years, six years? I think we need to sit down and pencil that out mm -hmm. and get really clear yeah. about that. I think, I think the many of the GLAD strategies, they are a finite number. We can integrate into professional development that we're gonna do for this literacy unit. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be a huge missed opportunity, an HMO huge missed opportunity if we don't do that at this yeah. juncture is because we're going to miss, I'm sorry. <laughs> is that a new thing? <laughs> it is a new thing in HMO. It would be a huge missed opportunity if mm -hmm. we don't integrate those strategies into this prof professional development. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. And as you're talking about penciling out that timetable, I would just plead with you to please do that with a sense of urgency because we have students here who are struggling. And if this is a promising practice, I, I would like it to be in front of them sooner rather than later. And if we have, and I have no idea how many teachers we have here, but if it's 10,000 teachers, two, 300 a year just makes it a lot harder, I think, to reach the milestones that we have in our strategic plan, which is to have those um, increases of third grade reading, because we have five points this year, but it's ramping up. And if we could take advantage of that sooner rather than later, I would appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you, thank you for this. And um, HMO, I thought, was what I had with my doctor, but I've learned something new tonight. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Ms. Dixit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Reed, uh, actually, I was looking forward to a video like you shared last time, because it's really uh, good to see the kids actually hey. doing something and performing in sports yes. or anything like that. So. But my question, I'm, I'm an English learner myself, and um, when these kids come from in like any country and they're, um, obviously I, I had learned in English in India, but I'm just saying a lot of kids come without any English knowledge. They come to school and I've seen them 
with very curious eyes. They want to look, they want to be, they be belong, they want to belong, they want to talk to everyone. And I've seen the support given one-on-one -on -one at elementary school level, I'm talking 10 years ago or so. And this kid to transform is from, I think, one of the Middle East countries. And he just, he was like a little lost ch child, like trying to understand what to do. And then just a few months, and he was talking like he was born here. I, I was so surprised to see that transformation. And, um, and I'm sure this is, this is, these are like common day stories, for especially for Marcia and, uh, and uh, you know, some of my colleagues that have worked in school, this is a very common thing they saw. Um, so um, I just wanted to ask uh, that some Title I schools, what are the resources given um, under this project, GLAD? So I'm hearing from Center Ridge uh, Elementary that they have like, kids speaking like 40 different dialects is they're having a lot of they're a little bit struggling there with uh, you know right. providing the support so um i think that we in fact miss clamico and i were recently discussing what extra supports we can provide even as we roll out the new literacy um basal resource so i think that's top of mind right now uh, do we have a Title I school response, Rich, to kind of what we're doing, or Dr. Ponce? I know you've been working with some of our schools with English language uh, programming as well, because we're looking at that model. I know you and Rich met. I don't know if you mm -hmm. have anything you want to add to how we're supporting Title I schools with uh, our multilingual supports. Um, I, I was ab about to send the, the whole number of teachers that we have in Title I. We are working uh, still counting all of them, uh, but we have been working together. Uh, we're going to work and kind of standardize practices in all Title I because uh, as you work in different Title Ones, they um, utilize the money differently, and this is what we are trying to do to make sure that, because uh, all of them are receiving uh, resources but also remember uh, some principles because in the way they were designed, they uh, spend a little bit differently than others. That's why when you go to Title I school, you see different resources and not necessarily because they don't have it or they did not receive it, it's because they uh, utilize it differently. But that's why we are working together to make sure that they standardize practices. Thank you, Dr. Ponce. Rich, anything else you want to add to that? Well, I would just say that Project, <coughs> excuse me, Project GLAD is, uh, we are focused specifically on Title I schools with Project GLAD because it is a more intensive professional development journey for each teacher. So these strategies, as, as Dr. Reed said, our goal is to embed strategies using UDL over the next few years for all teachers. With this specific program, it is research-based. It's, it's been around for a number of years out of California, New Mexico. And <clears throat> we found that, so the teachers, the reason why it is taking, we're doing a few hundred teachers at a time, is it's a two-day tr like classroom training and then four days of observation. Um, these are strategies that are used throughout the day, typically in content area during content time. So it will not overlap with the time that students are that teachers are using the basal resources and during language arts block. This is typically done during math, social studies, or science project GLAD strategies because we want our English learners, our multilingual learners, to understand content. And so these strategies are critical for that content understanding. So it doesn't mean that we can't use these strategies, we can't roll this out quicker in other ways. This particular promising practice, this particular program, is more of, a, or of an intense, and so we wanted to use a finite number of schools um, for these first few years. Center Ridge being one of them, to your, to your point. Yes. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Lee. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dixit. Ms. Sizemore-Heiser. Yeah, just briefly, um, first, thank you very much for this information. I'm glad to see very targeted work to, um, for our English language learners around um, literacy interventions and literacy education. So a couple of just quick questions. Um, just one thing I wanted to point out, I know you mentioned it, but the fact that 48.2% of our students have a home language, speak a home language other than English, I think is a really important data point that I just wanted to lift up. Um, to just, and then I noticed in slide seven, 
It talks about some of the purchase of Benchmark Express, talks about leveraging culture and first language knowledge and fostering learner agency. And I would love to know, and if you don't know tonight, it's a follow-up, how are we leveraging students' culture and how are we ensuring that what we're doing, whether it's literacy material or other, um, is culturally competent? And, and also culturally competent of sort of our families and the family engagement right. piece. I, um, I think we can certainly add to that. I know, Ms. Clemenko, you likely have a response to that. My response would be, I will take the grace of a little time Absolutely. to make sure I can give you a <laughs> okay. full response. Absolutely. Yeah, it just, it just struck, struck out to me because I think as someone, and I know I'm not the only one at this table who was there, but someone who was an English language learner and mm -hmm. for whom English was not my first language, um, I think having an awareness of what that feels mm -hmm. like and a cultural competency that goes along with that and a perspective taking perhaps right. would go a long way in terms of the success of our interventions and success of our programming. So I just was curious to learn a little more about how it fosters learner agency. And then um, I'm assuming with Project GLAD, which looks wonderful, the reason we're focusing on Title I schools is because you've done the data on the correlation between English language learners and Title I schools, and I'm assuming there's more concentration of English learners at Title I schools. I just wanted to... I um, believe that we are looking at the elementary schools that have the highest concentration of multilingual learners. That's correct. Thank you. That's, that was just one of my things. I know right. Title I schools are based on free and reduced price meal populations. Correct. And right. so I wanted to make sure that data was done, that it's a higher concentration of English or multilingual learners, I should Correct. say. Correct, yes. Um, and it sounds like a wonderful program. Those are really my two main questions, and I'd love it maybe offline at some point to understand a little more around the cultural aspect of some of the materials we bought. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Mr. Moon? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I, I, this is one of those things I, tr I really care about, and especially what I saw on page number four at the bottom uh, was what I had on my mind for many, many, many years to talk about uh, how English learners require greater emphasis on oral language development so they can attain sufficient language proficiency which in turn will allow reading comprehension. I know, you know, we all know that the needs of English language learners are diverse, all depending upon, uh, you know, where they came from, what educational backgrounds, you know, one may have, and et cetera. But especially those who come to the U.S. as a teenagers at the later stage, as opposed to those who are born but still language, second language, English language learners, or those who come here from very early age, kindergarten, even even you know even before that, that you know for those students who come at the later age, language development it's, it's not just developing the language, also develops their confidence in adapting to a new culture, new environment, new life, and and for many of them, many of them they need to really focus on their oral language development. They may already have some reading and writing, especially reading you know, skills, but many of them lack their oral language skills. And, and where I see a, uh, as an area for improvement, for school system to do, it's not, I know, it's not just on the part of the school system's job to do it, but when I see a students of a certain background, certain language background, just amongst themselves, instead of instead of be, you know instead of a interacting with the native speakers, they just because they they lack confidence in being able to communicate in English language with the native speakers. Uh, if they are only a stay with those who speak their native tongue. That's where I think we need to do a better job of encouraging those students to find a way to their newly developed oral language skills. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Ms. St. John Cunning. Thank you. I just have a few comments. I'm really glad, no pun intended, to see that we're doing this and that there's such an emphasis on, a strong emphasis on training our teachers. 
And I know that New Mexico has had a lot of success with this type of a program. Um, my family's from New Mexico, and I know that those schools have been really successful in helping multilingual uh, students. I'm a bilingual, um, bilingual person that grew up bilingually, and to what Mr. Moon was saying, and to the science of language acquisition, the first step is um, comprehension, and the next step, you know, it's is oral. So the fact that we're following the science of how we acquire language to going to that is really important. So I'm really happy to see this. One of the things I want to stress when we were looking at the graph, um, which is page number eight, is that we have students that come to us from countries from very, very different uh, academic backgrounds. And we have some that have had very little schooling, interrupted schooling, and very high levels of schooling. Uh, it's unfortunate that sometimes just because they don't speak the language, um, they can't demonstrate their knowledge, and the tests are in English, even though they may understand the content. So I think sometimes these graphs don't tell the full story, um, and I, I just wanted to point that out, because I've seen some kids that actually come in and say, wow, like, this is really easy work. They understand the content right. area, they just can't demonstrate it. Um, and just kudos to our ESOL teachers, because they're dealing with that spectrum of right. kids. And so um, I just wanted to stress that. I wanted to stress that we're also fortunate in Fairfax to have some of our immersion programs which help some of our kids. And to have kids that already have a language, it's a strength, and they're learning a second language. And as you say, some of them come to us bilingual with different languages, right. two other languages other than English. Uh, and in the end, the science shows that you may be behind initially, but then because of how your brain works and the connections, you will be ahead of a right. monolingual person. So I'm just really happy to see this. I'm, I'm really glad that we're, we're basing our um, program in with, these, with these students on a, an evidence-based approach, and I'm really looking forward to looking at the material. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. St. John Cunning. Seeing no others, we will move on to the next agenda item, and I invite colleagues to turn their lights off for the next one. All right. Next up, agenda item 8.02, Superintendent Matters. I draw out the calling of Dr. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What a fun uh, week it's been. We're now in March, right? Um, so that's exciting. Um, it's been a lot of events. I've seen a lot of board members at a number of our events. Last evening was one such event. We had our SEPTA hosted twice exceptional event with our uh, Special Education Parent Teacher Association, uh, 2E families, and it was quite a quite a crowd. We had a lot of folks in person and online. I appreciate the board members who took time to be there as well. Last week I had a chance to speak at our um, FCPS Equity Lead Institute. Dr. King's team put on a fabulous uh, day of training and reflection for over 350 school-based and central office-based equity leads. The theme this year was building bridges, breaking barriers, and how to build connections across diverse communities. It was extraordinarily well attended, and the topic of universal design for learning was an initiative um, that we talked about uh, within the Equity Institute. So it was uh, an excellent opportunity. Um, also want to mention that I had the opportunity to attend several basketball games, which of course were amazing. Our Centerville girls played very well, and our South Lakes boys and Hayfield boys had an amazing game the other night. Um, and our South Lake boys, I believe, are playing in the state championship Saturday at 1 o'clock in Richmond. And uh, I look forward to cheering our um, Seahawks on. There are the Seahawks, right? Yeah. Our Seahawks yeah. on. Uh, go Seahawks. Um, that comes easy uh, from Seattle. Uh, this past weekend, had a chance to be at the Real Food for Kids Culinary Challenge. And uh, I am amazed at the things our students can cook up. And a number of our schools also received awards. Um, Mr. Smith and Dr. Ponce and I had a chance, and Mr. Sacco, to be there. Um, we had winning entry teams from South Lakes High School. 
Luther Jackson Middle School also, and um, just a lot of excitement, a lot of food. Uh, last week on Monday, uh, just a really moving event, uh, the Dr. Larry Bussey Family and Community Library dedication, and the Bussey family was there and joined a number of uh, staff. It was just a really nice evening to reflect on the contributions of Dr. Bussey and the um, legacy he's left uh, for our community. And um, also had a chance to visit and speak at the Lunar New Year Chinese New Year Festival here in this room uh, last week. So at that point, I've had a chance to visit Stenwood Elementary, Westgate Elementary, Franklin Sherman Elementary, um, and there's just a lot going on. So lots of excitement. And um, also want to just give a shout out to Annandale Adams Head Adam, Sean DeRose. Um, who received the 2024 Northern Virginia Educational Leadership Award from Leadership Fairfax. So I'm sure Principal DeRose is watching this evening. I just want to give him a, a shout out and uh, the Adams are definitely in good hands. So, um, and then finally, I had a chance to attend the District 11 music assessment briefly and we have some great musicians. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to get out to a concert recently, uh, make some time. We've got some extraordinarily talented young people as well as our Reflection Art Awards. Um, so anyhow, have at it and uh, that's Superintendent Matters, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Up next, we have agenda item 8.03, <laughs> FY 2024 third quarter budget review. I call on Dr. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, am thrilled to have our Chief Financial Officer, really? Ms. Lee Burton, uh, present the third quarter budget um, report, although I would be remiss if I didn't say a big thank you to our social workers. It is National School Social Work Week, so thank you to all our social workers as well. And Dr. Or Ms. Burton, take the third quarter budget report away. I I, I'm really to. excited to hear this one. Um, good evening, Chairman Frisch, school board members, and Dr. Reed. The third quarter review offers an opportunity to revise the fiscal 24 budget based on any additional revenue that was received and make other adjustments as needed. The purpose of the quarterly budget review is to provide school board with information about the funds under their control and allow budget an opportunity to review all school department and centralized budgets to determine if any adjustments are needed. We do this three times a year, mid-year, which is in December, third quarter, which is in March, and then year-end, which happens in July. Section 1 um, provides revenue adjustments and reflects the funding that was received from a settlement from a class action lawsuit against a vape manufacturer of $3.2 million. The recommended expenditure changes, which align with the revenue, um, are also 3.2 million, and we are recommending an allocation to the safety and security screening pilot of 3.2 million. Recall that at year end, um, we allocated 3 million to the safety and security screening pilot, and we're proposing or recommending that we add an additional 3.2 million to that project um, at third quarter. Also, recall that the 6.7 million was included in the fiscal 23 year end to fund continue enhanced summer school. At the time of year end, plans um, were incomplete for summer school 24, the upcoming summer. Program locations were not available yet, potential participation hadn't been projected. Thus, these funds, the 6.7 million at year end, reside in the operating fund. But since then, of course, plans have solidified and the summer school program needs an allocation from the funds set aside at year end, which requires a transfer from the operating fund to the summer school fund, which is a sub fund in the grants fund. Staffs calculated the amount of additional funds needed to serve 35,000 students um, at 73 sites. And then section three reflects that transfer. Approximately half of the set aside funds are needed at 3.3 million. And this budget change merely moves half of the set aside funds from the operating to summer school, which is what the intended purpose was. 
The remaining pages detail changes to other funds and other supplemental information. We have eight other funds, um, and they're all multi-year funds, which that just means that funds flow from year to year with fund balance stabilization reserves as appropriate. Generally, and, and with this third quarter, we are recognizing authorized bond uh, proceeds for school, school construction, and then we have some increases to existing grants or new grants in food services, ACE, and the grant fund, and there are no changes to the other fund. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Burden. All right. We appreciate your time. We will move on to the next agenda item. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number nine, con uh, consent agenda. Our adopted rules of parliamentary procedure, Robert's Rules, provide for a consent agenda listing several items for approval of the board by a single motion. Many items listed have gone through board review and documentation has been provided to all board members and in the public in advance. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member prior to the meeting. The, con uh, the consent agenda is on the screen. Is there any objection to approving the consent agenda? Hearing and seeing no objection, the consent agenda is approved. Agenda item 10, new business. The following are new business agenda items. There will not be a vote on these items this evening, but action is scheduled at a future meeting. Agenda item 11, board committee reports. I will now call on uh, committee chairs to speak if they have anything to report. Audit committee chair, Mr. McElveen, do you have anything to report? Uh, just to report that our, um, our committee met um, a couple Mondays ago and we went over the annual audit plan among some other things. Uh, not too much going on at audit land right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Governance chair, Ms. Sizemore Heiser, do you have anything to report? I do. Um, the governance committee has been busy at work um, after the forum topic that the board passed in early February, I want to say, we have been working to uh, come up with a timeline for reviewing policy 8130. And we've been, so our timeline is to, for governance to have that policy review and revision complete by May of this year for then to move on to the board for a work session and further from there. So we have quite a bit of work ahead of this committee between now and May to do that. We have our next meeting um, next week and we're, we're going to start with a, developing our first revision of policy 8130 to then um, continue. Then we'll reach out to all the rest of the board members to hear their input and feedback before developing further drafts. So here we are. Thank you, Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Budget Committee Chair Dr. Anderson, do you have a report? Yes, I do. And I wish it was a happier one. Um, obviously, we've all been abreast of what's happening in the budget, and we know that the county has decided to advertise a real estate tax rate um, last Tuesday, which is the four cents, which will not help us to um, bridge the gap, except uh, unless the percentage changes. Um, so we still are facing an $89 million gap. We are hoping that any additional state funding, um, the conferees are expected to complete their work by the end of this week. I think the deadline is noon tomorrow. Hopefully that's done tomorrow. If not, then Saturday. Um, and hopefully that will help us bridge the gap. Um, it is likely that the board will have to have some conversations regarding re reducing the FY25 budget if we do not have that um, cushion be met by the state. And once the state and local funding levels are finalized in early spring, um, the superintendent, if we still need to um, make some reductions, will be providing typically some recommendations for the board's consideration. Um, and it will be a challenging discussion, but I think we need to um, be prepared for that. Um, that is kind of the scenario I think we're looking at at this point. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. A successful children and youth policy team, um, either Dr. Anderson or Ms. St. John Cunning, do you have a report? Ms. St. John okay. Cunning? Uh, we met this week and we're preparing for our upcoming public meeting. We're trying to flesh out the agenda. Some of the highlights we discussed were the opioid crisis, addressing chronic absenteeism and how we could get community involvement with that. Um, we're still trying to flesh that out, but um, it was a very productive conversation. 
Thank you, Ms. St. John Cunning. Agenda item number 12, board matters. Next on the agenda is board matters. I would call on each school board member to speak. Dr. Anderson, you're up first this week. Just so people know, the clerks have envisioned this ingenious method of making every one of us first at some point, and it just slowly moves down the dais. So if you were last, one day you will be first, and um, so you'll get your turn. And uh, I will go ahead with Miss St. John Cunning. We'll come back to Dr. Anderson. Uh, okay. Well, first of all, I can't say enough about um, our constituent, uh, little, uh, little Olivia, that presented to us today, and I want to thank her and her uh, parents and her sister for being here, as well as her assistant principal, Jason uh, Potton, from West Springfield Elementary School. Uh, I want to also highlight that a Walt Whitman Middle School student was a Senate page in Richmond. Uh, he is an eighth grade student. His family is military and they are currently stationed at Fort Belvoir. He was selected as a Senate space page by Scott Serval's office. He is one of 26 Senate pages currently serving on the General Assembly floor. Uh, the application process started in October, and RJ was notified of his appointment in December. He began living in Richmond during the week in January, and his last day as a page is this Friday, March 8th. Um, also, I want to, uh, for those basketball fans, we're going to have the Kingstown Cup this Friday on March 8th. Boys and girls teams from Hayfield and Twain will meet for the fourth time on the basketball court at the Kingstown Cup. The Kingstown Cup was first played on March 2019, and the event was created to heighten respective student body sense of belonging in their schools. Whether you were an athlete or on the court, participating in the pep band, singing the national anthem, or simply rooting in the stands, everyone, even for just one evening, can be connected to one another. And I have to wear green and orange for both teams that night. Um, the middle school district uh, orchestra assessment this weekend, March 8th and 9th, had four schools and 26 ensembles will participate uh, and be scored for their performances. This is a celebration of the amazing music education happening in the greater Alexandria area. Mr. Martin Garfield Levine is the director of the orchestra at Mark Twain. Middle school is this year's event chair. Uh, thank you to Ms. Alicia Day, Jeff, Jeff Collin, I sorry I mispronounced that, from West Potomac High School for her role as a host. Uh, so a lot of great things going on in Franconia. Thank you, Ms. St. John Cunning. Dr. Anderson. Thank you. Um, yesterday, I had the honor to attend, also with Mr. Moon, the FanQuest Special Olympics basketball game at Annandale High School, where the Adams took on the Justice Wolves. It was so exciting and so amazing. I, I absolutely loved it. The kids cheered so hard, and they had amazing lighting. It, it was a fantastic opportunity. Um, last week, I also had the opportunity to read to some enthusiastic students at Braddock Elementary Schools through the Readathon to the Read On Young Readers Program. This is a program that was founded to mitigate the potential reading for English language loss for students um, due to remote learning um, during the COVID pandemic. This program has expanded to include in-person readings in addition to the virtual program. And it currently exists at Mason Crest Elementary and Braddock Elementary, and they are looking to expand further. Um, two weeks ago, Falls Church High School held an open house to showcase the renovation and progress to the community. Um, because the open house was on a school board night, uh, Mr. Frisch and I were unable to attend, but I did manage to have a sneak peek, and it was it's a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic space. The labs are tremendous and top of, you know, state of the art, just a wonderful facility. So I'm very excited that our students are going to be able to see some of the new things rather than just living through just the construction. Um, Annandale High School was recently recognized for its exceptional newsletter, the Annandale Community Insider, the awards of communication and excellence to celebrate the creation of exceptional websites, newsletters, and social media content. So again, go Adams, as well to say congratulations to uh, Mr. DeRose for his award um, because he's doing some really great things there. 
I do want to highlight some students. Last month, senior Simone Pendleton became Falls Church's girls basketball all-time leading scorer when she hit 1,316 points. She was also named to first team all-region National District Player of the Year and Defensive Player of the Year. Congratulations to you, Simone. Also, congratulations to state swim champions from Justice High School, Emma Redman, in both the 100-yard um, breaststroke and the 200-yard individual medley. In the girls' 200-yard um, freestyle relay team, Claire Coughlin, Annika Wentland, Reagan Camshore, and Emma Redman, they rock. And I also have the opportunity to see these girls swim all throughout the summer because we're in the same pool and they coach my daughter. Um, also, congratulations to Mason District student Victoria Bujorno from Edison High School, who received the Award of Merit for her, photogra for her photography in Virginia's PTA's Reflections Art Contest. So great things are happening in the Mason District. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Ms. Lady. So Ramadan starts Sunday um, at sundown, and so I just want to uplift uh, those in our community who observe. Also, to echo Dr. Reed, it's National School Social Worker Week. Uh, we thank you for all you do. So often, constituents ask me how they can share their thoughts on issues important to their family and students. Right now, we have several ways for you to do that. Um, please join FCPS at the next Community Conversations on Opioids on March 18 at 6.30 at Lake Braddock High School. Um, also, we have two budget Drainsville Town Halls coming up. One is this coming Monday, the 11th. That will be with Supervisor Bierman and myself and our CFOs. Um, and we will be at the McLean Community Center at 7 o'clock on March 11th, and we will be at Hernan High School on Monday, March 18, for a second town hall. Also, we invite you to complete the family engagement survey, which has been sent to parents um, on March 3rd via email, and because your, your feedback helps us uh, best support our students. We also will be doing community conversations again this year, and those will commence in April. And then on to some school news. Today I visited Hutchison Elementary School with our Chief of Schools, Dr. Ponce. Thank you to Principal Ayala and her staff for such an in-depth look at their programs to address the needs of their students. It was wonderful to see their practices at work in the classroom across all grade levels. Congratulations to over 700 FCBS winners of the 2024 Regional Scholastic Art Award, including winners from Herndon High School, Langley, and McLean. Special congratulations to Meredith Yu, Langley High School, whose piece, Shake It Off, was nominated as one of the five Best in Show American Visions Awards. An exhibition of gold key and silver key winning pieces will be displayed at Northern Virginia Community College, Ernst Community Cultural Center in Annadale now through March 14th. McLean High School, Shanley High School, and West Springfield High School are among 28 schools nationwide selected as recipients of the 2024 First Amendment Press Freedom Award. For McLean High School, this is the ninth win and the seventh consecutive award. Congratulations to the Highlanders. Also, I want to congratulate the McLean High School Quiz Bowl team who won the state title. Finally, I invite constituents to visit the McLean Project for the Arts in the McLean Community Center to view two other art exhibits, the Langley Pyramid Youth Art Show now through March 11th and the McLean Pyramid March um, Art Show from March 13th through the 30th, featuring work by students, elementary through high school, and both pyramids. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Lady. Mr. McElveen. Pass. Thank you. Ms. Sizemore-Heiser. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited. Uh, this week I got a chance, along with my colleague, Ms. Anderson, to attend the West Springfield High School PTSA meeting and talk all things capacity and um, other issues related to West Springfield. I also attended um, virtually the SEPTA 2E uh, meeting last night, and I, I congratulate SEPTA for another great um, meeting on 2E issues, and I, I know I have Dr. Um, Reed's promise that there's more work coming on that, and so I'm excited to see um, that great work. Um, I am so sorry I missed Annandale's fan quest this week. I had a conflict, but I'm really excited to attend both Lake Braddock and Robinson's fan quest, both on Friday night, so it's gonna be quite the trick to stop by one and then run to the other, and luckily they're only three miles apart. So um, for those who don't know fan quest, it's an amazing, phenomenal event, so come on out to Lake Braddock or Robinson. Friday night. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Miss Olivia, the student who spoke earlier uh, in support of Disability Awareness Week, and I have actually invited her to come back um, for our next meeting when I bring a proclamation on neurodiversity celebrations and ask her to come speak again. So I hope she takes me up, and I told her it would make my night if she does. So I hope she. 
Right, um, and then I want to also um, congratulate Irving Middle School, who's recently recognized as a WUSA 9 Eco Challenge winner. It's an opportunity for local schools to win $5,000 from Washington Gas to make their eco-friendly products projects a reality. So they use donated and recycled I items to build an aquaphonics um, system, which is really phenomenal that our kids are doing that. West Springfield High School was one of three high schools along with Chantilly and McLean to receive the Journalism Education Association's 2024 First Amendment Press Freedom Award. And this is the second consecutive award for West Springfield High School. So congratulations to the Spartans on um, recognizing how to support, teach, and protect First Amendment rights with an emphasis on student-run media. It is super, super exciting. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to lift up that Woodson High School's drama class will present a public performance of The Last Firefly, free for any student, pay what you can, ticket option for parents, on one day only, Saturday, March 9th at 10 a.m. It is the fantastic story of Boom, a child of thunder, <laughs> and a mythical adventure about discovering one's inner strength. So for those you're interested in boom and mythical adventures and discovering your inner strength, please check out Woodson. It is recommended for grades two and above, so just as an FYI there. And the last thing I wanted to mention is I want to congratulate um, the following Braddock District Schools for earning VHSL State Championships. We have Robinson Secondary, Class 6 Golf, Woodson High School Esports Rocket League. Um, in non-VHSL activities, Robinson Symphonic Band has been recognized as a Virginia Music Educators Select Performing Ensemble Group. And I'd also like to recognize the Boys 400 Meter Swim Relay um, from Lake Braddock for breaking not just a Lake Braddock school record, but a VHSL state record. So congratulations to the super fast swimmers at Lake Braddock. So with that, I am looking forward to, forward to a weekend of fun events at um, um, FanQuest, and um, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Mr. Moon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thought about passing just like my colleague, Mr. McIrvin. Uh, but I, I must point out that, uh, oh, by the way, Dr. Reed, the a Lunar New Year celebration you and I, along with uh, some other board members, attended uh, a, those outside the Chinese community called that Lunar New Year celebration as opposed to Chinese New Year. Mr. McElvey might call it Chinese New Year, but I, but I don't. So, so having said that, uh, I am going down to Richmond this Saturday. I, I don't know who else is going besides Dr. Reed. I expect to see her just to uh, a really be a good cheerleader. I did go to South Lakes High School yesterday to pick up a couple of T-shirts. So I'm gonna be I'm gonna be proudly wearing Seahawks T-shirts down in Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Ms. Dixit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Thank you for all the community members, parents, students, principal, and staff who participated in the Sully District Budget Town Hall with uh, Supervisor Kathy Smith. I'm grateful for your input and thoughtful comments. Um, it was a good turnout. We really had a good conversation, good questions coming uh, that day. Uh, Ms. Lee Burden was there with Ellis. So um, I also... Uh, I wanted to talk about the proclamation today on Women's History Month. I wanted to take a moment to celebrate uh, the women's making history in our schools, including my colleagues in the school board office and on the FCPS leadership team. Approximately 75% of our nation's teachers' workforce is made up of women. I honor their passion, hard work, and resilience. I'm very proud of the students on Shantley High School our winning the 10 consecutive first amendment press freedom award for journalistic excellence is very just amazing um, our two other fcps winner of this award were mclean high school and west high west springfield high school congrats to them all uh, thank you so much good night thank you ms dixit ms anderson First, I want to say thank you to the Cherry Run kiddos that came and sang to us tonight. Um, they did a beautiful job, and I, it was really exciting to see them. Um, I have a few other things to share. I'm pleased to have 
co-sponsored two annual Fairfax job teen fairs, or teen job fairs. One that was last weekend at Chantilly High School, and one is this weekend at West Springfield High School from 11 to 1, and it is open to all teens in Fairfax County. It was really cool to see all the different businesses that are out there interacting with our kids. Um, the Chantilly High School Technolo Technology Student Association is holding a tech fair that I'm particularly excited about um, on Saturday, March 16th from 10 to 2 in that cafeteria. And they're going to have slime, elephant toothpaste, Ozobots, like all the stuff that I am really love doing. Um, and the entrance fee is $5 and all proceeds go to the American Cancer Soci or Society. Um, I was grateful to join the Lake Braddock Secondary School Autistic Student Association last week at their meeting to hear their concerns and suggestions, proving what I already know, that we have some amazing students who have a wealth of knowledge that we need to do more to tap into. I've also been welcomed for school visits by some of our amazing principals. I was able to visit Lewis High School, Chantilly High School, and Greenbrier East and West Elementary Schools. I was also able to swing by the recent instructional job fair at Lake Braddock a few weeks ago. It was really exciting to see our school staff working together to show all that our county has to offer for new applicants. And last but not least, I had an amazing conversation with one of our own staff members in the last few days that's doing amazing work in the world related to education for students about hazing in memory of her cousin Adam. I would like to thank Dr. Reed for highlighting her work in the last week. Um, to staff and Courtney thank you for your time and I can't wait to see where we can go from here thank you miss Anderson miss Marin I am accepting invitations for music in our schools month events thank you to our music educators um, education would be flat without music and if you get that pun thank a music teacher so I was disappointed to miss Marshall Road Elementary's International Night, which was tonight. I went last year and it was phenomenal. Uh, tomorrow, I'm starting the day bright and early, actually with this lady over at Madison High School to hear about their grading approaches, um, something that I'm really interested in. I hope the board will uh, continue to look at our grading policy and discuss grading practices in the near future. In the evening, I'm headed to Hernan High School for their Heritage Night, featuring the step team that I saw perform last month at the Herndon Library, uh, among other performances and, and things. Yes, South Lakes High School basketball, I am going to be there to cheer on the Seahawks, because they're not only my constituents, but my fifth grader budding basketball playing Seahawks son would not want to miss it. So it's very exciting. It's the first time I think in 20 years that they're going. So um, Hayfield has been a tough c competitor the last two years. So um, I wanted to share some praise for incredible athletic and artistic achievements, some of which I've had the opportunity to see. The Scholastic Art Awards last night, really, as Dr. Ponce said um, in his opening remarks, they really just reveal what our students are feeling and experiencing, and it's, it's really just an amazing window to see our, our students' um, thoughts and experiences. And uh, with generous scholarships from our community, like the Vienna Arts Society and the League of Rest and Artists and Arts Fairfax, so it's really a spectacular event at Nova Community College, which graciously hosts it. South Lakes Pyram is also hosting more art uh, at both Rest and Community Center locations, and I'll be there on Sunday and Thursday for those events. Um, we have athletes in um, our community, the fastest four runners in Virginia history in the four by 800 on the track team um, at a South Lakes High School. Aya, Catalina, um, uh, Caroline, and Bella. And um, I also had some good conversations this week about 2E, twice exceptional learning. I know Dr. Reed had her conversation that I could make while I was at the Scholastic Art Awards. But um, my appointee to the Advanced Academic Advisory Committee filled me in on the work happening there. And I would love for our board to talk about that more in depth. I know we all have ideas and passions. Finally, Ramadan Mubarak for those who are celebrating this upcoming holiday. Good night. Thank you, Ms. Marin. I'll take my turn. Uh, this week I had an opportunity to visit a school bus stop in Mantua um, to talk with some parents about their concerns over some uh, road safety and student pedestrian safety issues. It was, uh, I very much appreciated their candid feedback and being able to be there on hand for that conversation. Um, last week I had an opportunity uh, to judge uh, the artwork for the Regional Scholastic Art Awards and like Ms. Marin said, it was such a delight to see the talented work of our students. Um, and you can see it too through March 12th uh, at, Virginia Community at Northern Virginia Community College in the Ernst uh, Community and Cultural Center. Um, I was also able to observe our uh, government students at Woodson High School as they presented and debated legislation 
um, as part of their annual student congress. Um, the League of Women Voters were also on hand registering eligible young voters uh, for this election, so that was nice to see. This weekend, I am volunteering with Food for Others at right here at Luther Jackson Middle School. Uh, they play a vital role in addressing food insecurity throughout Fairfax County, uh, going above and beyond uh, to serve our communities and make a positive impact in the lives of many students and their families. Um, they are just such a caring and committed force in our community, and I very much appreciate their work. I'll also be attending the Fairfax County NAACP's Advocacy Agenda Rollout on Saturday. And on Sunday, I will be uh, at the Fairfax County Peace Awards, um, which are nearly 20 years running now, um, and encourage everyone, all of our students, to think more about peace as both a means and an end, and it recognizes those young leaders who work as peace members, uh, peacemakers. And finally, I've heard from various members of our community, students and parents, who are worried about recent news they've seen, and I want to send a message of reassurance to them. Fairfax County Public Schools remains committed to fostering safe, supportive, welcoming, and inclusive school environment for all students and staff, including our transgender and gender expansive students and staff. It is clear that students learn most effectively when they feel safe and supported and respected and accepted for who they are. All students have a right to privacy in Fairfax County Public Schools facilities or while participating in Fairfax County Public Schools sponsored events and activities. Any student who has a need or desire for increased privacy, regardless of the underlying reason, is provided with reasonable accommodations, including single user facilities. Thank you, have a good night everyone. We're adjourned. <laughs>